Good morning, friends and family. Farm A family, good morning. How y'all doing this morning? It's good to see everybody. Look at this smile on my face. We're going to get started in a couple minutes. If you can make your way to your seats, we'd really appreciate it because we'd love to try to stay as, to, as close to on time as possible. So if you make your way to your seats, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. We are live streaming, so share with your friends. Go to Farm Aid's YouTube channel if they want to tune in and see your lovely faces this morning. Thank you all so much for being here. We're going to get started in one minute. All right, y'all, we're going to get started. If you can settle down, if we can have your attention. We're going to open the space with a land blessing. My name is Angutak, a uh, Yupik person. Uh, that song is the inner tribal song that I learned uh, to recognize our ancestors. Of, well, and it's the inner tribal. So I want to go backwards from here because at this point, there's over 150 tribal nations that exist in this in the state of Indiana, and then going back to the struggle is there's still a lot of uh, nations here that are struggling to get recognized. So I wanted to honor the, the ancestors first of this land. So that song was the honor the ancestors. So that's, that's the first thing I, that, that I do when I go into somebody else's land is I'm coming here as a real person. Ingayak, ingaya. So as a real person, here I am. And so that's, that's the traditional song when we come in our kayak. The, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to sing that because I just wanted to sing the inner tribal song, but I just, it, that's, that's, that's part of what I do personally, and, but I also think collectively we have to recognize that there's tribes in this state working for, right from, from this area, uh, Miami, the Kickapoo, that are working for recognition, 
uh, that have, and the Miami still have a treaty with the United States that's never been been recognized in the state. So, so that's the, you, you know, and we we do have the Potawatomi that that do have uh, recognition there uh, with the uh, uh, Poc Chief Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. Um, so I just wanted to give the land acknowledgement. There's multiple tribes that have been 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 moved over the last couple hundred, three hundred years uh, due to the settler colonial uh, uh, occupation, and so so I think I think that, you know the land acknowledgement is really important personally because that's just what we do and what my ancestors, my, my elders taught me. When you go to somebody else's land, you you, you respect the people and also the ancestors of that land. And so, so, so that's, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to do here to open it up is, is give that acknowledgement to, a, to, to our ancestors before us and let us move forward in a good way. And, and, uh, and I want to say Chamai, welcome. I guess this is the opening of Farm Aid, right? Farm Aid 2023, give yourselves a hand, you made it. So I think I think we'll go ahead and 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 move on with the with the uh, with the uh, continuation of this beautiful uh, concornucopia of people recognizing we have uh, some look I see some some I recognize some faces of some fisher friends and some small family farmers uh, some advocates uh, so this is a great opportunity uh, to share and build with each other thank you. Thank you so much. I feel welcomed and appreciated. I want to bring up our fearless leader at Farm Aid, Carolyn Mugar. Give her some love. Well, that welcome was um, the welcome that did it for me, I think. Recognizing whose shoulders we stand on and being here today, part of them, part of who we are today. And I see people that have been amongst us and they've gone on to work in other areas that strengthen us and it's, it's a great welcome. Today really is what Farm Aid is about. We, the concert and the show, the festival, is what brings other people in with us. But Today represents, is a representation of what we do every day, and that is work with family farmers and people who are fighting for family farmers. So that is the, that is the big arms around today. And I just want to welcome everybody. I'm always happy to be at the pre-events to Farm Aid because they are Farm Aid. So feel welcome. Be sure to speak up. Be sure to hear, have your voice heard loud and clear, and welcome. Don't trip on the wires. Thank you so much. I have a book of Carolinisms um, that I will expose one of these days. <laughs> it's magnificent. You have to read it. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for welcoming all of us. Um, and so I'm going to bring up um, Caitlin next, who will introduce our first panel. We spent a lot of time in Indiana, so this first panel will feature some of the folks that we've, these first two panels, will feature some of the folks we've interacted with and had experiences with. So thank you, Caitlin. Come on up. She's a member of our hotline team. Works behind the scenes, <laughs> thanklessly. So appreciative of you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. So our first panel will be the culture of agriculture in Indiana. The culture of survival makes our collective solutions and representation even more vital. Whether it's keeping family land in the family or investing in production practices that heal our ailing planet. We will take a high level look at our shared ecosystem within the overall food production landscape in Indiana. We will explore how farmers on their own and through a shared legacy are contributing to the collective story 
of who farms in Indiana, past, present, and future. We will learn how this group of farmers will steer the way forward to protect our planet and land from further harm. Our panelists and moderators are Denise Jamerson, farmer and owner of Legacy Taste of the Garden. Robert Fru from Sobre Mesa Farm. Mark Baird from Wholesome Harvest Farms. And our moderator for the first panel is Virginia Pleasant, the co-executive director of the Northwest Indiana Food Council. Is it on now? All right. Hi, everybody. I am really just honored and pleased to be on a stage with these three folks who are doing incredible work throughout the state of Indiana. Um, as she said, I'm Virginia Pleasant, one of the, uh, the, one of the co-executive directors of the Northwest Indiana Food Council. Uh, we are, as the name might indicate, working in Northwest Indiana to cultivate a just, thriving, and regenerative food system for all in our region. Um, and we do that by really trying to uplift the stories of farmers and connect the needs of food justice with farm viability. Um, I would like to give everybody here on the stage with me a moment to introduce themselves as well. Mark, you're right next to me, so I guess I'll start with you. Mark Baird, uh, Wholesome Harvest Farms. We are a farm in Tipton County, Indiana, just north of here. Uh, a traditional, uh, started out as traditional commodity farming and we've expanded to some direct-to-consumer um, products as well. Good morning. Is this on? <laughs> We're looking for the button. Good morning. My name's Robert Fru. I'm from Sobre Mesa Farm. Myself and Juan Carlos Arango were the two that started the farm. Um, and our goal at the farm is really to sort of be an inclusive element in the community of Bloomington that hosts different events for uh, all ages and people from lots of different backgrounds uh, representing different ethnic groups. We try to host a lot of uh, culturally specific events at the farm, including presenters who are from other uh, cultural language groups. And um, we endeavor to reach out to the larger community in southern Indiana and help educate them about the importance of uh, soil and water conservation and different remediation methods that can be used uh, on a farm. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I am Denise Greer Jamerson, and I am from southern Indiana. I'm from a place called Lyle Station, Indiana, which is the last remaining African-American farming settlement in Indiana. I grew up on a farm, which is Greer Farms, and my father is still farming um, at 86, and he's also recognized as one of the last African-American farmers still farming land that's been in our family since pre-Civil War. So I'm a generational farmer. Me and my family have created Legacy Taste of the Garden, and one of our missions is, is to show people um, a sustainable, viable lifestyle through agriculture, from the youth to the seniors to succession planning and making sure that um, we can educate and help all who want to farm and all who want to continue to keep the farms in their land, in their families, their legacies. Thank you. So. I think you just cued me up perfectly for the first question here. I'm wondering um, if we can talk a little bit about connecting to place and thinking about those that came before us. Denise and Mark, both of you have families with long histories in agriculture, and I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit, and all of us, a little bit about how that's changed over the years and um, what that connection to place means. 
So I think the biggest change for us, a fifth generation farm uh, to start out with. So the farm's been in the family for over 100 years. Tipton County is um, a, a very primitive county when it was settled and a lot of work had to go into clearing and, and draining the land. Uh, of course, initially, a lot of farms were vertically integrated with everything uh, from chickens to hogs to crops and, and, and whatnot, and eventually um, melding into commodity farms, which we still have, and that's the majority of farms probably in America right now that feeds America. We've diversified and are still in the process of doing that. And I think the biggest change is the direct to consumer um, movement over the last probably 10 to 20 years. And that's really helped us not only communicate with our consumers directly to explain to them what farming is about. And I think that's one of the things that we can do as, as farmers is better communicate with the end user. Uh, what we found uh, that works for us in central Indiana is farmers markets. So we have the ability and the opportunity to communicate with those consumers each and every week. And we really enjoy making them understand what we do. Because there's a lot of misconceptions, as you know, about what we do on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether it's educating them on organic, non-GMO, uh, all sorts of things. So. That's the biggest change for us is the direct-to-consumer uh, movement that's taken place over the last several years. So um, for us in rural southern Indiana and being um, African-American farmers, I think that um, the change that is seen, that I have seen and, and experienced is seeing the decline of African-American farmers. So with that being said, and my dad still farming, my son wanting to go into farming, um, the accessibility. So when my dad came up, he worked with the mule. Um, him and his sister, you know, plowed the field with the mules. Change came, he went into big ag. Um, it, was, it was available and accessible for him to be able to do that as time went on, um, it didn't, it, it was not so easy. Um, a lot of land loss, we've seen that. So fast forward to my son going into agriculture, um, just being able to change. Agriculture is always changing. That's where I'm saying my dad had to change from a mule. He went to combines and tractors and commodities um, from produce and so now, there has to be a change in order to stay into agriculture is what we see. And making that change is being able to um, make people aware of their food. Um, it went from family farms to big farm. So now we're back to changing again to knowing who your farmer is, where your food comes from, how important agriculture is to a lifestyle, to families. Um, so the, that change um, knowing that you have to change. Agriculture is always changing. And I think that um, going forward, that's what we try to teach people, that there's opportunities, there's a lifestyle, it's a viable lifestyle, sustainable lifestyle, but you have to be willing to acknowledge change and make the change. Being responsive, right? <laughs> um, Robert, you are not coming from a multi-generational farm, and so I'm wondering if you can enlighten some of these folks who may already know quite a bit about this, but about some of the challenges and uh, what the experience of being a first generation farmer in Indiana has been like. Sure. Yeah, that's probably something that uh, Juan Carlos and I both have really found to be a challenge because when you start uh, from very little knowledge and you're trying to create a business centered around growing food and uh, really helping a community around you connect with what's happening on a small scale farm. How do they work and what is their real ethos? And at our farm, we really wanted to focus on the background, the strong backgrounds that we both had and that was in being volunteers and working with the National Wildlife Federation. 
So through that experience, we realized the value of native species here in Indiana and understanding how it is that we could really help others to be able to uh, connect with that, with that important component of being on a piece of land, how can you maintain part of it for habitat for the different species that you really want to help you to farm. And that's something that took many years to learn. We've gotten better at it, and we've also helped to educate others along the way uh, about the importance of utilizing all the different components together on a small-scale farm where you're trying to grow organically, sustainably, and you're trying to make a favorable ecological impact around you. So that for us, I think, has really uh, been the most uh, important part of our journey is figuring out how we can stay connected to the community around us and help educate them better on what they can do to help somewhat mitigate these uh, extremes that we're experiencing in the climate. I love that you all have such a commitment to education, too. Um, you know, you said it was hard for you to gain some of that knowledge when you were starting out, and it seems like you're probably filling a bit of that role for others now that are, that are coming up after you. So it's coming full circle, right? <laughs> All right, so moving on, um, we know that Indiana imports 98% of its produce. Um, and this in spite of the fact that in the most recent USDA Ag Census in 2017, we have over 56,000 farms in Indiana. It's quite an interesting paradigm. And I'm wondering if any of you can speak to some of the challenges that might be contributing to it. Well, I think one of the challenges, uh, specifically around the produce side of it, is we have uh, many uh, we have many preparers of food. Uh, one of the biggest preparers of food that goes to the restaurant uh, facilities is Park 100 Foods, and uh, ironically, they are located in our in our county, which is one of the most productive counties in the state, if not the nation but none of their produce comes from Tipton County. It's all shipped in. And the reason is, is that we lack the infrastructure to process that produce. They want it ready to put in the pot, so to speak, and there's not that facility there to help that along. Obviously, the costs and the infrastructure necessary is prohibitive to most farms, so that's when cooperative farming comes into place and we need to continue to get help to put those facilities together. Uh, but I would say uh, those aggregators and those uh, middle links that seem to be missing for us so that we can actually supply the produce and the food to those entities that are preparing it for the larger schools, restaurants, and even end users in the grocery stores. And if I could speak to that a little bit, I think that um, what you're saying is very true. And then when you are looking at the numbers, those are the numbers that are your commodity farmers. They're not your produce farmers that we are here. We may not be counted, but they don't know how prevalent we are and that we are in the communities and that we are growing this food. And like you said, we, we are in a space to where we need the infrastructure in order to even compete with the bigger companies that are out there that are also producing or bringing the food in and not really looking at where they are and where we are. Would you? Would you like to add anything, Robert? I could add a little bit to that. Um, and again, you know, our story is somewhat different because of the uh, sort of the newness of everything that we're doing at the farm. But we really wanted a way to uh, engage the community that doesn't often have access to uh, food that I would consider first class. And that is food that is organically grown food that is extremely fresh, harvested uh, preferably the same day, 
and uh, at the consumer's home that same day. So that was a challenge for us. We tried to really figure out how can we make that happen. And on a small scale farm, one of the ways to do that is connect with the community, get a community supported agriculture agreement in place with different consumers and also to engage with the pantries and fortunately in Indiana there were funds that came down through COVID and uh, as Mark mentioned about an aggregator earlier there was someone in Bloomington an organization that was willing to take that on so that was a way to help farmers particularly BIPOC farmers to really engage with their community in a way they perhaps had not been able to do so before because of a lack of funding, uh, a lack of a consistent stream of uh, customers, so to speak, through pantries. And uh, for us in this past year, I think that has really been uh, probably uh, the greatest learning curve we've had to experience in the portion of the farm that provides food. Uh, the other parts we're still working on as far as engaging the community, but this part of growing food for your local community has really been um, has really been a, a great experience for us in the sense that we can stay connected, we can engage people to come to the farm, see how their food is grown, and that is not something that was the experience of my grandparents or any of my uncles and aunts. Farms were very closed off from from the rest of the community. Uh, so I think that model is maybe a little unique for us. Absolutely. Um, I've heard it touched on a little bit here, this emphasis on commodity crops in Indiana, which you know I view as one of the biggest barriers to eating more local fruits and vegetables and produce. Um, Mark, you've also talked a little bit about how more commodity growers are trying to shift that. You yourself are diversifying your income streams. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what inspired that decision. And um, I'll follow up in a little bit with Denise about maybe what some of the barriers are for folks that are coming up. You all do a lot of advocacy and mentorship in the community as well. And there's a lot of barriers out there for folks that are just getting started out. So. Yes, yeah, so I, I think one of the biggest barriers is uh, is the the amount of money to to enter the farming business. If anybody's checked out a new uh, a price of a new combine or a new tractor, it's it's astronomical. The average the average I would say the average farmer simply can't afford that. Uh, so if we want to perpetuate our farm to the next generation, we realized that we had to do something a little bit different, and that's the whole direct to consumer part of it. If you cut out the middleman, uh, you, you gain the middleman's profit, if you will. So that's what we've, thank you. That's what we've endeavored to do. Uh, it's not our only stream of income, as Denise said. It, it can't be our only uh, uh, stream of income, at least right now, but there's a real possibility that it could be. And, and I think, uh, you know, we started small in this, and it has grown over the last several years, and we're optimistic that it can sustain a farm to multiple generations. The other thing is the equipment that it takes uh, to do small-scale farming is not the large-scale equipment. So the capital intensiveness of that smaller-scale farm is very attractive to those that want to be in, into farming. And uh, we're optimistic. Uh, like I said, education is very important to us. And once you start to educate the consumer, they're behind you. They support you. They understand your predicament and are better able and better uh, equipped uh, with empathy behind your cause. We're not looking for a handout. We're looking for a viable way uh, to make a living. And I think we've found a niche that I think can be perpetuated. Denise, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, like he said, to get into farming now, um, farming now is really controlled. Uh, the commodity farming, like what my father is doing, everything that he does, where, where he started, 
It wasn't controlled. He could keep his seed and plant it the next season. He could, you know, do, um, he has some control over the fertilizer that he used or the, over the seed that he used, where now he doesn't have any control. So he really, um, his profits, like you said, is, is not really like it used to be. Um, to get into the farming, I understand now what I didn't understand before. Even when I was growing up, <laughs> we ran the other business, which was the animals and the food and the garden, while he was doing the commodity crops of the wheat and the corn and the soybeans. And I have learned that all farmers still had to do that, be diversified. So it's not just the commodity crops that help them to survive as farmers. Um, it was being diversified. And then now I understand why the farmers around me, which are the aging farmers, have meticulous um, equipment. My dad just don't let anybody drive his equipment. And he's had, he, you know, in, in our community, it was a farming community. He, he had young men that always worked with him. He showed them how to farm. And now, you know, just not anybody could get on the combine. Just not anybody can go jump on the tractor because he can't afford a $200,000 piece of equipment now, whereas before he could buy the whole set. That's what he told me, I could buy the tractor, I could get the planner, I could get the header, you know, but now it's, it's so much more. And then for the next generation coming up, if they're not allowed to make the profits um, from what they're putting in the fields, then they're at a disadvantage. So the, the thing is, is, is that teaching them the new ways, teaching them to diversify, teaching them the specialty crops, and being open to being able to do that. And I think that um, that comes along with the succession planning. You know, planning for the farm to continue, for the legacy to continue, we have to take all those things into consideration that if that piece of equipment breaks down, it, we can't just count on the price that we're going to get at the grain elevator. So, but we can go to the farmer's markets and sell our produce and, and, and get into programs to help feed the community and get the community to know and to trust and to believe and to support us. Absolutely. I think, you know, Mark, you alluded to some of the funding that came down through COVID, and I think COVID did a couple of things. First of all, there's just been this fire hose of funding that's been coming down to help, you know, revitalize and to help build up more resilient food systems that are local or regionally based. But from my perspective, it also really opened people's eyes to just how fragile that import system is. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Robert, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the narrative about agriculture in Indiana and what some of the misconceptions are? Yeah. I think for us, we really I think for us, we really felt that probably the main misconception was that we would have to do all of this on our own. And we realized that there really was a community out there who were farming and we're willing to offer uh, their advice, their suggestions, and uh, often their help. So I was really encouraged by that, uh, getting into a field that we knew very little about. And I would say that still goes on today, and we have also done the same for others, helped with uh, labor or equipment or the sharing pieces of equipment with other neighbors who are doing farming. And I think uh, that sort of engagement and cooperation with other farmers and other like-minded people in the community has really helped us to be uh, what I would call successful at the farm. Um, successful in the sense that, no, we're not making a lot of money, 
but we are impacting the lives of many people in ways that, uh, that benefit both of us. And uh, that, to me, is, is really a definition of success, I think, in life. Denise, do you want to talk at all about the narrative of farming in Indiana and some of the misconceptions? Sure. Um, I think that um, one of the misconceptions was that there were no BIPOC farmers in Indiana. But with me coming from an a African-American farming community, um, we kind of debunked that misconception. Uh, we created um, like the Black Loom Conference so that we could connect. Number one, we could show the visibility that there are BIPOC farmers in Indiana. They may not be in that number of the 56,000, but we're here, we're growing, we're providing for our communities and to connect them with the agencies and the services that are there so that the agencies and services know that we're here and that we can benefit from the programs that are out there designated for us. Because I think that a lot of us did not know or did not understand that there are programs that can help us to do what we do. And I also feel as though that people, there's a misconception about farming, um, not being able to get into it, uh, but there's still a desire. You know, farmers have a desire to uh, provide and that desire is still here very much rooted in Indiana and in the Indiana farm hometown families absolutely um, mark I know uh, when we talked last week you had some thoughts about some of the misconceptions about farming in Indiana Yes, and I, th I think it's carried on by the popular media that all farmers are now corporate farmers or they have uh, all their land has been taken to a corporate farm. Now, to be sure, that is a pressure. That is a pressure on, in Indiana as well as across the nation. Uh, in our county, we were probably the number one county producing seed corn uh, for the rest of the nation uh, at one point in time. Uh, one of the major growers or one of the major providers or processors moved out uh, the, grow the growers uh, several years ago. And I think that was the beginning of trying to figure out what we're going to do as farmers uh, as far as diversification. But the point is uh, there are still some legacy seed companies uh, left in, in the area and they're putting tremendous pressure on land prices that the average farmer simply can't afford. Uh, or they find it very difficult to, to finance. Uh, but uh, having said that, most of the farms we have in our county are family legacy farms. The uh, farm landowner may not farm themselves, but the farmer that's renting that land is, is a local farmer, or at least local in the sense of, of the region. So uh, there are pressures from corporate farms, but I, I think uh, we can do a, a uh, a better job maybe of educating the public that hey there's a lot of family farms around here and, and there's a lot of folks that just because the name on the plat book says uh, ABC LLC that doesn't mean that it's a corporate farm it means it's organized in a corporation in order to better uh, to better efficiently use Uncle Sam's tax uh, code. So anyway, that's one of the things that we had talked about beforehand and I wanted to make sure and, and uh, announce, not that you don't already know that, but uh, I think the family farm I is alive. It may not be well all the time, but it is definitely alive. I'm going to throw a wild card in here because <laughs> I'm hearing a theme here about cooperation and family and you just mentioned the family farm may not always be well. So what does success look like? And what does that social sustainability look like for the family farm? Education. <laughs> Education and access. I, for me, is getting the information to the legacy farm families to be able to make that change 
to so that they can more benefit because like I said when when the generation before me went into farming it was not like it is now so it is imperative that number one we educate the legis the legacy families on how to do a succession plan on how to do a business plan and bringing the whole family into the operation of understanding farming and the landowners because where I'm at there are a lot of landowners my dad does a lot of the farming for the families um, that are not there so they're landowners but they need a succession plan they need to understand that they need a succession plan because there are buzzards out there flying around waiting to get that land but in order for us to help them for for me it is to be able to educate them and to help them and to guide them and to bring trusted information in to help them in their successional planning and communicating that it's so important yeah the succession planning um we hosted a workshop uh, this was pre-covid so i mean it was probably a good five years ago and Every farmer that showed up to that workshop, and they're small scale farmers, they're in their, you know, their first generation farmers, but not one of them had considered the importance of that business side of things and what happens if they get hit by a bus tomorrow. How do you plan for that and how do you plan for that sustainability? So I'm I'm really glad that you that you mentioned that. Well, it was a true wake up call for, for our family. I took a workshop and they were like easy things like where are the keys to the combine? what <laughs> but you know when my dad is the accountant he's the marketer he's the he's the grower he's the that's that's old farming that's the old way of farming and not the business model farmers like to do it all <laughs> it's not just the farmer hat it's the business hat the the marketing hat um robert what does success or sustainability look like on the family farm I think for us, we, um, again, with like what Denise said, this education is really important. That's one of the things that we do at Sobre Mesa Farm. We try to uh, help share with others what we have learned from other experts and make that knowledge more accessible to people who are interested in learning maybe how to start their own farm. and. We do that by sharing some of the challenges that we had. Um, moving into a community that was perhaps uh, dominated by legacy farmers and trying to uh, access some of the services locally, finding out who is really the best excavator in the area, who are those key people that you need to have in your uh, phone or your Rolodex and uh, that can help you be successful on your farm because you really cannot do it all. You do have to have a core support group and many of those people are professionals in other fields. And one of the things we learned as volunteers with the National Wildlife Federation was that when we got engaged in another opportunity to share the bounty that we see around us with other people, it's another opportunity for people to figure out how do I pick a pumpkin or you know do I have to pull the stem off or do I need a saw to stem to pull that stem off or is this one ready or is it not ready or can I pick a green pumpkin sure you can pick a green pumpkin but you're gonna have to pay it per pound you know whatever it is so but anyway that's I think it's it's always thinking about sustainability and what that next generation needs to push forward and, and hopefully we will continue to do that. And I would encourage other farmers to, to look ahead. You know, the farming group is, is an older, older group. Denise talked about her father. Uh, they're not necessarily always open to change. Uh, I know my brothers are, are quite a lot older than I am and they run uh, a lot of the commodity operation on, on, our, on the farm and the extended families farm, but they have been open to change. And, and that's the key to this. Uh, is to be open to change. If you're not, then I think there's a real problem on succession. And you see a lot of that. You see a lot of farms going to auction, not because, they, uh, not because they're not sustainable if they were run a different way, but because there's not an interest 
from a family member to carry that on. They see the dollar signs and they get attracted by that and that's when sometimes the larger corporate farms step in and, and buy, that, buy that farm. If we can stay close to our neighbor, stay close to the a relationship with our neighbor, build a relationship with that farm that we've been farming for years, then maybe we have the opportunity to purchase that farm and expand our farm instead of trying to compete with folks that we really can't compete with in a public auction. Uh, public auctions are great for those folks that, that need them to, to sustain their livelihood, but relationships build farms over the course of the year, whether that's direct to consumer or whether that's business to business. I'm going to pause for a moment and see if we have any questions from the audience for our panelists. That hand went up really quick. <laughs> Is there a microphone? The microphone is coming. <laughs> Hi, my name is Juanita Brandt. I just happen to be a state rep from Ohio. So I'm actually gonna ask you from, Hi. <laughs> For those who are wondering why I'm here, I sit as a um, ranking member on agriculture in, our, in the Ohio House, and 14 years in 4-H. So farming, poultry is what I grew up doing as a kid in Cleveland, and we had a farm in Giaga. Small short story. The reason why I'm asking questions is because here in the state of Ohio, we just implemented a policy called the First Time Farmers Tax Credit. So as we talk about farmers being able to transition into farming, and then farmers who, and I, I actually have a question with this, but I'm making a statement. <laughs> policy is king, so we just implemented this program called the First Time Farmers Tax Credit, which allows farmers to who are buying um, property from an older farmer or whoever, and it's less than 10 years can get up to a million dollars in a tax credit from the state of Ohio. Um, but that also helps the existing farmer who wants to sell because they also benefit from the tax credit. So it's kind of like everybody benefits from that. So that just got started in April of this year in Ohio. So we don't know how well that's gonna go because the marketing has been piss poor to be for real. <laughs> and you know, marketing is everything. You can have a great policy, but if you don't have the marketing, it's everything. So this is where I asked you guys. You sit here, it's quite a few of us who are all elected. We all sit on our um, you know, respective ad committees and our different state houses. I think it's about six states over here, and we're all elected. What type of policy needs to occur on the state level, let's not talk federal, because none of us are in Congress or US senators yet. <laughs> Shameless plug for my friend JD. But what type of policy should we be implementing? Because I keep hearing about how we are not keeping farmers in place. Um, also, like even in Ohio, we have like these 0% loans that we offer our farmers because we know capital is king and people just need access to capital. I don't think Ohio has it all together because we just implemented both of these programs this year. Who knows what's gonna happen with it. But tell us what we need to be doing on the side of government to better help make sure that you guys can sustain yourselves long term. Thank you. I hope we have some folks from Indiana listening to those new policies happening in Ohio, because I, I think we could benefit from some of those. Who wants to jump in on the, the policy question? Well, I'll, I'll jump in uh, just briefly. Uh, you know, your, your policies, I, I think, are excellent, because you hit at the heart of what some of the problems are for beginning farmers, and that's financing. Uh, how do I get started? Again, when when you look at a, at a combine or a tractor or whatnot, uh, a new one costing what it is, it's virtually impossible to even set your mind to farming when that's the case. But uh, I think you have uh, at least a baseline in those programs that I think a lot of states could, could learn from. One thing that hasn't been mentioned here that, that uh, hopefully people have an interest in is renewable energy. And I think um, a lot of farms in Indiana especially have the opportunity to, uh, at least farmland owners, have the opportunity to, uh, to look at, at both solar and wind. And I know in our county, we have uh, a, a rather large wind farm, which has been great for the community, great for the county. Uh, farms can benefit because it doesn't take as much land as, as, 
uh, as a solar farm, and but but there has been a, a groundswell of of opponents out there that either don't understand uh, the the, uh, the farm background and the farm land uh, property uh, rights issue. Uh, and they are scared to death for whatever reason of, of windmills and, and solar panels. So it doesn't sound like it's close to what we're talking about, but it really is in that that policy comes from the state. It comes from the state. And, and I'll point to what Illinois did in making uh, a lot of those decisions at the state level instead of at the county level. Because when you have a hodgepodge of ordinances from one county to the other, it's extremely difficult for these developers that are, are out there trying to put uh, larger wind farms or uh, solar farms together to even come together to, to say that we're going to try this when they know one county may be receptive, another county may not be, one township may say no. Uh, the people get up in arms because of, of things they really don't understand. So state policy, and we almost had it in Indiana a couple years ago. It got right up to the finish line and the ball got dropped for whatever reason. So from a state policy perspective, renewable energy can help the farm landowners out tremendously, but we need some consistency across the state. Denise, I see you're ready to <laughs> answer the policy question. Yeah, um, for me, we're not in Missouri, but it's called show me. Okay, so what better example? That's why I am here is because I am a black farmer, right? And people got to see black farmers to even know that there are black farmers, that there were black farmers, and that we are here. So two parts, you know, what you're doing is great because the existing farmer, the legacy farmer needs that to say, okay, good, I'm, I'm okay with giving it up. My family's gonna be okay, my legacy's gonna be okay, my farm is gonna be okay, you know? And then the other part is, is the, the farmer that's gonna take it over, that's a, the beginning farmer, that's a good thing too, but I hate to say it, but talk is cheap. You gotta walk it out. You have to be able to say, this family benefited from this and let the family show, yes, there is this. But when you, this is notorious, is that there's things state. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think would be quite helpful, uh, certainly in Indiana and maybe in Ohio, and other states uh, that are here is that, uh, and I'm really going to talk about this from uh, an angle of climate change. So farms overall can have a great impact on what is happening on land and soil and in the water that we all depend upon to drink from. So. As far as I know, every state in the United States has some component of soil and water conservation. Uh, and in Indiana, I think one of the things that would be really beneficial is if we had block grants set up that came from the state and were given to all the different counties that had soil and water conservation offices, allow them to invest that money overall. And so farmers can't do it all. They have to have someone help them. And the state, every state, can do that by rolling out education programs, helping farmers understand we have funds available, you can tap into these, it's a simple process, and we are here to support you. We have another question over here from the audience. And while she's getting the mic, I would add on the, the note of climate and water, it would be great if we could get our wetland protection back. Oh my goodness, that is my question. <laughs> that is my question. So We must be like linked up or something in our, I mean, <laughs> some hive mind yes, going on. Yes, so I do, I do serve in the Indiana legislature and wetlands. And also when you live in a state that, you know, you I think the phrase draining the land 
how do we find a balance? Because I feel that there is this tension at the State House with our environmental advocates and our farming advocates when I feel there is, there's so much common ground there, to use a great metaphor. Thank you for, for that, because I think you know, wetland preservation is, is very important. And uh, farms have, have done a, a moderately good job of that. But uh, as you say, there's a conflict there. Uh, there's a conflict in that the, the factory that uh, the farmer uses, which is the land to grow the food, is, is in conflict with that wetland. The frustration that I've seen in, in farmers, and we've even experienced it our, ourselves, is uh, preparing land for, for cultivation, and uh, maybe the agent comes out and says, you know, you're good except for this one quarter acre that's in the middle. And uh, yeah, as, as nonsensical as that, as that seems, it's either, okay, we've got to decide whether we're not going to clear that land for the quarter acre, or if you're going to allow us to mitigate that some other way. So I think wetland mitigation is, is at least one of the solutions to that. If someone wants to expand a field beyond what it currently is, and it has a, a small amount of wetland in it, which happens a lot in, in Indiana, then at least give that, that farm or maybe require that farm to mitigate that somewhere else in the state or, or in the community that's helpful into a parkland, into a, a land, part, of the, part of a land adjacent to a state forest or a state park. Expand that uh, to, to do that. So I, I think mitigation uh, is, is probably one of the solutions to that. Uh, it's probably not uh, the ideal and it's probably not what you all want to hear. But that is, is sort of a common sense way to take care of these quarter acre, half acre, little plots that, that come back to us and say, you know, we can't allow you to do that because there's a quarter acre of wetland in there. Well, okay, let's find a solution to that. And we have worked through uh, the USDA to, to solve those, but it's not an easy process. It, it, with WOTUS, it, it's not an easy process, and I think there was some that want to resurrect WOTUS in, in, the, in, in the bad way, and that's not particularly helpful to the farmers that, that feed America. And uh, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the farming paradigm that we may not like to acknowledge, but it's out there. And, and there needs to be some mitigation effort or mitigation opportunity to help that along. Denise, Robert, would you like to add anything to that? Um, maybe one thing is that uh, I think that, you know, the wetlands is a, is a really important issue. I agree with that. And I would say that, you know, the USDA and other entities are very willing to invest in the sense of helping farmers uh, to grow a lot of the commodities and to price control. What about the issue of helping farmers to grow a green future? And why can't the US government really invest heavily in that in ways that a farmer can rely upon uh, a section of their land to no longer be growing a particular type of food, but rather be creating and growing a wetland which has far-reaching benefits to all of us. So an annual, uh, an annual investment, not a small payment, but something that equals or exceeds what they would gain from that land if it were planted with a commodity crop. I think there's, you know, there's some tension there between for commodity growers that, that need to expand. But changing that paradigm, whether it comes from payments from the government or changing a paradigm to where we're not farming at these non-human scales anymore can make it more possible to protect our wetlands into the future. Does, oh, I knew I hadn't looked this way. I've got two questions back here. <laughs> Go 
Um, yeah, I'm a um, lifelong produce farmer from California, so I was really interested in the in the comment that uh, the state imported 98 percent of its produce, and uh, California's you know, hurting produce production from uh, water issues and availability of labor and labor that costs more than a minimum of twenty dollars an hour, twenty five dollars an hour with the uh, taxes on top of it, and and I wonder, uh, Mark, you mentioned infrastructure, but I also wonder about just the knowledge base that's left the state, you know, is it there in the extension agency and the in the schools to teach about vegetable production and and make it possible for uh, commodity farmers to to um, you know put some of their land into producing produce? Yeah, good question. I agree. Uh, I would say there there is some of that knowledge in the state, but there's not enough. Uh, and, and I don't think that knowledge base will come. It's almost a chicken and egg thing. The knowledge base will come when someone has the forethought to build the infrastructure to put in place that needs it, and then they would educate the farmers on, okay, what do we need in a sweet potato? What do we need in a green bean? What do we need in, in, in whatever produce you're talking about? California is a prime example of it, it probably, I don't know, pr produces probably close to 50% of the produce that, that's consumed in the United States. Well, with water issues out there, and water issues are coming to Indiana too, I wanna to tell you, uh, we have to do a, a better job at diversifying the ge geography of, of growing that produce. And, and I think uh, education is, it was, is gonna be a big part of that. The bigger part of it though is the cost of the infrastructure. We've got to we've got to do a, a good job, and maybe the state policy-wise uh, can go back. You know, IDC does a great job in 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 acquiring land and building for the future in certain parts of the state. But maybe some of that money can be used to looking at at agriculture and how Indiana can grow its own produce to consume, not only for Indiana but the surrounding states because we are the breadbasket uh, of, of the Midwest here. I know Iowa and Illinois is gonna argue with that, but some of the best soils in the world are right here in Indiana. There you go. <laughs> Denise, Robert, anything to add to the, that question on resources? No, totally agree. <laughs> Check. <laughs> there was another question. Yep. Sorry, I, is this on? Uh, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Chris Baggett, Tender Pond Farm. We're a regenerative grass-fed beef operation in Hancock County. Um, I have a perception, and I think this might be directed to you, Mark, back to the wetlands. And if there's a wetlands that's been a wetlands for 200 years of Indiana's history that suddenly a farmer decides today I need to farm that, something's in, this is a perception. I'd like you to help me if, that's, if this is real that there's an incentive with crop insurance to now start farming a lot more marginal land. In our county, I mean, I see trees being cut down every single day along roads just to get, it feels like, an extra 20 yards of, of corn and soybeans. And my understanding is that's because crop insurance incents the farmer to do that. Is that accurate? Uh, that, that may be true. Uh, but going back to what I think Robert uh, alluded to, you know, years ago, and I think it's still in place to some extent, uh, the federal government had the CRP program in, in place. And I think there is still some acreage in that, but a CRP program that paid the farmer, the farmland owner, uh, a living wage, if you will, to keep that wetland in, in place, uh, you, you know, would get signed up all the time. Crop insurance, I'm not so sure. I'd have to think about that, Chris, because Crop insurance is extremely expensive, extremely expensive. I just got our bill uh, the other week, and I'm, I'm kind of shaking my head. Uh, and I, I know there's a lot of farmers that at the end of the day, can I afford to pay this? Because it is, it is not cheap. And I, would, I wouldn't choose to clear a piece of land because I thought the crop insurance would pay for it, but I'm not going to say that that doesn't happen out there. I guess it depends on the scale, probably. But I think a solution 
that I just happened to think of when Robert was talking is resurrecting uh, at least the CRP program on steroids from a policy standpoint. Um, and that would, that would get to the pocketbook of the farmland owner and the farmer to help mitigate some of the, some of the, uh, the wetland issues that, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, we have another question right here. Yeah. Well, um, hi, I'm Savvy Horn Land Loss uh, Prevention Project in Durham, North Carolina. It's not so much a question, but sort of an intervention of how we frame uh, wetlands. And so much of it has to do with how, as a society, we see the Environmental Protection Agency and its role. So part of what the EPA had been trying to do with regard to wetlands and its protection was to bring them within the fold of the um, Clean Water Act and, uh, and waters of the U.S. And that was basically blocked by Congress as an overreach on the part of the EPA, and part of it is the status of the EPA, right? It's not a cabinet level agency. You have an administrator. And then when you think about where we are with climate change and, and the need to just elevate, um, you know, how the USDA and other agencies operate, it's just not farming. It's about the impact. On, on climate and the impact in, in environmental justice communities. So to just not give protection to an isolated wetland, I, I don't see how that's going to help us further along. And then when you have the states' rights people blocking that, then it becomes so complicated from state to state, but fundamentally, it's whether wetlands, isolated wetlands, are within the protection that will guarantee all Americans clean water, access to clean water, and mitigation against climate change, and wind, and all the other things. We saw what happened in Louisiana when wetlands were gutted, and th I mean, there was no barrier to break, right, the impact of you know, hurricanes after hurricanes. So we need to see the wetlands as basically the lungs of America and to protect it as much as we can and to balance the interests, you know, in favor of the environment. I think, I think that's critically important. So I think it's an interesting place because it is part policy, it is part how we perceive how are we going to live in this special climate change, or some call the Anthropocene, this new era of humanity? How are we going to balance these competing interests? That's kind of what I have to say. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Thank you. Uh, Joel Greeno, farmer, uh, Kendall, Wisconsin. Um, just to the elected officials and some of the questions that were directed toward them. First and foremost, we need to protect the rule of law. And you need to utilize your state's attorney generals on all of these ag issues. Otherwise, we're going to lose that rule of law. Talked to a lady before this meeting started that is, uh, just got their notice from DFA. Dairy Farmers of America that they're probably not going to be milking cows anymore because they're not going to take their milk. Well, in 2004, Ali Ramadan from our U.S. Department of Justice did an investigation into the U.S. dairy industry. That investigation ran two years. He found the U.S. dairy industry more corrupt than Enron. And the most, the three companies investigated in that investigation was Dairy Farmers of America, Dean Foods, and National Dairy Holdings. Ali Ramadan was fired by the U.S. Attorney General 
uh, Roberto Gonzalez under George Bush. 30-year veteran with a perfect record, terminated. So in 2010, National Family Farm Coalition had a meeting in D.C. where Toby, or, uh, Mark Toby came, a representative from DOJ, and I specifically asked him, why do you not enforce antitrust? And he kind of hemmed and hawed and stumbled around, and he said, well, technically the law is not the law anymore. It's like, really? So what is it? And he said, well, we like to call it the greater good. I said, well, could you define what the greater good is? And he said, well, we've been instructed, you know, not to honor antitrust. We've been told that if total vertical integration will feed us cheaper, we're not to stand in its way. Well, 13 years later, here we are all still fighting the same fight. And so I testified before the DOJ in 2010. I said, you have to reopen that case and finish it. So Christine Varney, that was the uh, head of the antitrust division of DOJ under Eric Holder, tried to reopen the case, was not allowed to, and resigned her position. Our elected state officials need to push their attorney generals to unify with other states' attorney generals on these issues and push that forward. Otherwise, we're all gonna continue to lose in this fight because you know, we talk about all these issues and how hard it is to fit into the system when we're talking about million dollar combines, $750,000 tractors, you know, it, it's impossible to survive. Now we have UAW on strike, and, and God bless them that they have a union that represents, but you got people going from $50 an hour looking for $70 an hour, and you know, I put in what hours I can on my farm during the day, and then I work for Ocean Spray Cranberries 12 hour night shifts. I have kids in a different town, and so, you know. And meanwhile, the farmer's share of the dollar is about 13 cents, right? I exactly. I do want to make sure we leave room for this other question yep. over here, but yep. thank you. But absolutely just wanted to let them know, you know, we need to utilize our state's attorney generals in these issues just to maintain that rule of law and keep this process, you know, so we have it to use and we need it. Absolutely. Use your voice. <laughs> One more question over here. How's everybody doing? Ty Simmons, farmer, um, food advocate. Um, young man said that where's the people with the knowledge in, in produce? We have the knowledge here. We just need more of our state reps, our advocates to assist us for more of a bottom up approach. Um, the trickle down approach doesn't work anymore. We have to build the farmer and the farmers up from the bottom so we can educate them better so we can create a better farming solution. We're here and we're coming, okay? All right, I do wanna close out with one last question for our panel here. Um, I'm wondering if each of you can speak a little bit to what solutions or innovations or opportunities you think hold the most promise for building a thriving future for our Indiana farmers. Well, it's gonna be pretty short for me. I think you've already heard it. It's going to be diversification and direct consumer. Continue that that march toward the consumer. Cut out the middleman. Take what the middleman has and use it to sustain your farm. I think for me, it's more about uh, trying to really educate the youth. Bring the youth to your farm. Open it up for that space. Engage with other entities who can table at your farm and bring their expertise to sort of help create a rounded picture of what it's like to grow food and that you can successfully do that as a small-scale farmer. However, you must use all the resources available to you. You have to reach out and create all of these collaborations that I spoke about earlier. Denise, where are the opportunities? <laughs> The opportunities for Indiana and planning for our success. A meteorologist told me, told us uh, a couple of summers ago that Indiana would 
deal with like six degrees change in the climate change. Although it's a small amount of degree of a change, it's going to make a big change. So I say that to say that six degree, the six degree separation law is, you know, you are only so many people away from opportunities and knowing and being a part of connecting, building the agriculture in Indiana. Um, I think that the connection with the kids, the, um, there is a generational gap uh, from the family farm that I grew up on to the youth of today not knowing the farm, not knowing where their food came from. So that little bit of, of a difference of us coming together in this state, working together, and being that, having that six degree of separation rule. You know, I think that going back to knowing town to town, market to market, and being able to know who's your farmer. We're the Hoosiers. So knowing who's your farmer. Yeah. Forget about Kevin Bacon, it's six degrees to your farmer, right? <laughs> so to all of the legislators and electeds in the room, I think you heard it right here. We need support with education, we need support with diversification, and we need support in building those connections so that farmer stories are being told and that they can thrive into the future. Um, thank you, everybody, panel, please give them a, a round of applause. Thank you. All right, we're gonna transition right into our next panel. Right after he gets this cute picture. <laughs> Let's give our panelists another round of applause, please, as they exit the stage. And thank you, Ms. Denise. <laughs> as well as our moderator. Yep. So what a lovely start to our day and way to get to know the people of Indiana and the communities they serve. Um, so this next panel is gonna focus more on food sovereignty, how we can make that accessible. It's not this pie in the sky kind of dream. Um, so if we can get settled, I'm gonna uh, let um, Rachel, who is another one of our hotline operators at Farm Aid, those folks that work behind the scenes, we wanna make sure you get to know their faces, know their story. So Rachel has been with our hotline since 2021. She is a former teacher and farmhand. She was trained in interfaith chaplain, chaplaincy. I didn't even know that the word. She tried to be a chaplain. <laughs> but on a personal tip, Rachel brings so much spirit and, and vibrancy to the work that she does and is so humbling. So please give Rachel a hand as she comes up to introduce our next panel. Thank you, it's an honor to see everyone here. Um, our next panel is called From Regenerative to Restorative, The Right to Food Sovereignty in Indiana. So the relationship between food sovereignty and climate change is one that centers restoration. The restoring of land back to those who've been forcefully denied or displaced. And the redemptive practice of actively reconciling what is owed to fill the gaps created by that displacement. There is a shared story here that can benefit us all. So our panelists today are um, Lauren McAllister. Yay. <laughs> Lauren is a manager at Bloomington's People's Market. People's Cooperative Market. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ty Simmons. Ty is the director at Human Agriculture Co Cooperative. For Justin. I can introduce the moderator. We're waiting for Justin. The moderator is Tatiana Rebel. They are the director of Equitable Initiatives with Earth Charter Indiana. You're going to come up. Oh, I see. Should we just get started? I got a long intro. Okay. Wait. <laughs> While we, we wait for there. Justin, I guess we can either start the panel or wait until Justin gets here. Say five. Say five. We can yeah. talk the entire hour. Yeah, we can. Yeah. 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 All right, we gotta get these five. Break. Kick it off. Yeah, I mean we can do the whole thing. I mean thing. we can do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My intro is about five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah let's just do it. Two minutes. He'll be in two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so let's go. Let's listen, we'll fill it. Okay, okay. Can we introduce him? I'll introduce him, yeah. Um, when they arrive, Justin Solet um, works as an activist and organizer with North American Marine Alliance. <laughs> All right, testing. Can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. We wanted to create space. Um, to get centered. Everyone is worried that if we take a break, we'll lose you. <laughs> and we don't want to lose you all, but we're also waiting for one of our pres presenters, uh, panelists to be here. Um, so I want to be able to utilize this moment. Actually, this is a great time for us to get centered. Hi, everyone. How are we doing over here? I can't see y'all over here. Everyone good? Okay. Woo. Yeah, how are we going over here? <laughs> All right, we want to take a moment, everybody. Let's, uh, if you can, feet apart, straighten up your back. Let's take a moment together to just be present with each other and ourselves in this moment, recognize the space that we are in. We are here to collectively share experience, so if you need to kind of Shake your shoulders a little bit. Let's take a deep breath in as a collective. Let's relieve it as a collective. Hi, everyone. That felt good, didn't it? That felt good. Um, hello, everyone. I also want to create space, too. As you can tell, we are a lively bunch. <laughs> uh, and we are here to create space to talk about food sovereignty. Um, we want to be very aware of where we're at, the life experiences of all of us in this space, including our panelists and presenters. Uh, we do ask that you do not assume anyone's pronouns. If you are here doing press, please speak to panelists about their pronouns, how they prefer their name to be called, and how they would like to represent themselves. Um, we want to honor everyone in their experience. Ty is here, but we're also going to take another breath so Ty can get centered with us as well. Um, Justin, sorry, Ty is right here. I know you're ready. You were even answering some stuff on the last one. I was like, look at you creating space for yourself. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Thanks for making it. Sorry, I was late. No, no you're so right good. Time, Do you need to take a moment? No, I'm fine, actually. Okay, okay. Um, what I would like to do, um, I'm going to introduce myself for a moment so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I am the director of equitable initiatives with Earth Charter Indiana. Uh, we are a climate change organization that is youth-centered, 
and intergenerational in our approach to um, helping to combat climate change in Indiana. We just celebrated or in the midst of now our 21st year here doing this work. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be in this space. Food access is uh, my number one passion and it changed my life. Um, and I'm grateful to be in this space with everyone. Um, I would like to just kind of go down the row and have each of you really kind of establish what brought you to this moment um, right here and the, and the work you do. And don't be afraid to actually like, you know, gas yourself up a little bit. <laughs> I'm ready. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Justin Sole. I'm a citizen of the United Homa Nation, uh, the largest state recognized tribe in South Louisiana. Uh, <clears throat> when I say South Louisiana, I am from an hour and a half south of New Orleans. Mm. Yes, there is south of New Orleans. <laughs> uh, I actually work for an organization called Healthy Gulf. We are a climate change organization working for, working towards um, a just and true transition to renewables. We um, work on environmental justice, racial justice, climate justice, labor justice, mm. and we follow the HMS principles in all of our work. Um, I've been a Gulf South advocate. Basically, I look back now my whole life. But my work started in 2009 when commercial fishermen went on strike because of low shrimp prices. And fast forward eight, six, eight months was when Deepwater Horizon happened and 11 people lost their lives in the Gulf of Mexico. So my work really started then and I'm here with actual Gulf delegation. If y'all would stand, please. Hey, Gulf. Yeah. Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome. We are, we are fighting for the rights of our commercial fishermen and other BIPOC communities that are being run over by industry in South Louisiana. Um, I also work for an a committee or coalition called LAFS, which is Louisiana Against False Solutions, battling the encroachment and overtaking of communities by carbon capture and sequestration, which is a false solution, we believe. <laughs> so, I can get on a soapbox, but I'll let it go. Come on, come on, come on. I feel you. Appreciate y'all having Welcome me. Here. Thank you. Welcome here. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren McAllister, and I am a generational farmer. I didn't know that before. At first, our farm got three sheep. Someone called our bluff for our wedding, and now we're at 55 sheep. It was a slippery slope. Um, knowing that we could shift our entire community with love was not something I was aware of at the time. My work began because there was a Nazi at our farmer's market. My work began because the city didn't protect us. My work began because 12 other women came together and said we had enough. Mm. We were done. <clears throat> and instead of seeking revenge, we started repair. We started to find out ways of mending the gaps, of showing up, and to really find some joy. And so I'll have to quote Ross Gay, who is part of the inspiration of my work, investing directly in my farm and in our community with his poetry. And I farm for joy. My ancestor didn't get to do that. So I get to find joy. And Ross describes joy as an ember. I know, he'd be doing it, he'd be doing it. A precursor, possibly, to a wild, unpredictable, transgressive, and unboundaried solidarity with each other. Mm. So that's why I'm here. Thank you both. Well, I'm not off to the top of the head like them. So, uh, my name is Ty Simmons, <laughs> and I'm the Executive Director of Human Agriculture Cooperative, Northeast Indiana LFPA, and the Family and Friends Fund, which is a racial equity um, organization and consulting business. Um, we steward over 17 acres, especially uh, crossed by educating, mentoring, and training our youth, community members, in farming, food distribution, racial and environmental uh, justice, and vocational training. 100% oh, of you eat, right? Right? <laughs> so the 1% is feeding the 100%, the 99. So, well, the 100, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, along with Legacy Taste of the Garden, People's Collective Market, 
dozens of others. We distributed over 3 million pounds of food during the pandemic. In several, in, in several cities in the Midwest with the Trump administration, Michelle Obama's organization called Partnership of a Healthy America, um, dozens of churches, um, to basically feed the people when our communities weren't coming together to help feed ourselves. Um, our newest collaboration with Indiana Department of Health, USDA, Palipos Collective Market, Legacy Taste of the Garden, dozens of black IPOC and white farmers throughout the state, not, not only to feed underserved communities in, in our state, but throughout the nation. We focus on building farms, farmers, and our youth to create a better food system in Indiana and throughout the nation. We work with over 500 farmers in Indiana and throughout the nation to increase food access here and other social disadvantaged and underserved communities while focused on equity, not equality, and breaking barriers and creating policies and building relationships. We need more partnerships. I see all the acronyms. I see all the state representatives. I see all the advocates. We need more partnerships to assist in breaking these barriers in paperwork, policies, the hearts of individuals, the acronyms and large corporations, and other equipment companies. Our motto is together, we're better and stronger. And every day, we prove it. All right? Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day. <laughs> I love how you came with a full-on statement. Um, so this panel, <laughs> this panel, the focus is food sovereignty, right? And the discussion on this people-centered, people-controlled food systems. And I would love for each of you to kind of tap on how does food sovereignty relate to justice? Um, food justice work, climate justice work, racial justice work. We're going to do justice for the whole justices, right? Um, can each of you talk about how you personally, your work delves into that and the greater work of um, growing food and what that looks like in the world of climate injustice? Who wants to start? I think there's a lot there, and I love your question, right? Because it opens this floodgates of really touching each other in a sincere way, knowing that food does something for us that nothing else can do. It gathers us, it tells our story, and we are here to gather seeds for people we will never meet. Mm -hmm. Folks who are gonna be eating far beyond our lifetimes, and so, when I think about food security, which is what we all begin our journey with, do I have enough food? Three meals a day are served at a jail. So food security isn't my goal. I'm seeking a joyous relationship with the planet. One in which the reciprocal relationship is at the heart and that I know I cannot farm on my own. So the justice part for people's market, people's cooperative market, is shifting from community-supported agriculture, because I don't know your community, into cooperative-supported agriculture. And we talked a little bit about it before, but cooperating is a skill all of us can acquire. We all need to do it, and we haven't been practicing. And so that justice piece for people's market is restorative justice. We believe you the first time. We agree that you need help, and we will find it for you. We don't need barriers to holding each other. We don't need barriers to repair. And so a lot of what's going on in that question, the sovereignty, is how are we repairing what's happened? How are we holding our sorrows and our griefs so that we can do the work for the future? That's the sovereignty. We won't even be holding it. It's our future generations who are going to hold it. Uh, I come from a family of commercial fishermen, uh, probably five, six generations of commercial fishermen, and justice and sovereignty actually is what we do. Mm. Um, not just feeding the nation with the best seafood you'll ever taste and have on your plate, but it, the best, it because it is... Uh, local um i hear a lot of buying local eating local because it helps your neighbors it helps 
put money in people's pockets. It helps feed people with the best of what is grown. But we don't grow it, we catch it, but it's there for us. My people are water people. We have always lived in the water. The water has given us what we need to survive. So what we take from the water we give as blessings to everyone else. And not only do we feed people, we feed ourselves off of our catch. And we're in a fight right now with not being able to feed ourselves because we can't make enough to feed our families. Um, <clears throat> biggest thing is imported seafood is actually uh, what's killing us, um, driving us out of the industry. And we're fighting to actually make a living <laughs> and live and survive. So that's the justice part of it. The sovereignty part of it is actually being able to be a self-sustaining industry where we can actually feed our family on what we love. We love to work. We love our seafood. We love sharing it. And that sovereignty part of it, being able to work your own hours, being out there whenever you get, just walk out your house, get on your boat, make your own times, and feed your family at the same time is the sovereignty part. And that goes directly into justice. What is more just than feeding your family? What is more just than making a living while feeding others? You're right. You know, and those are the decisions that we are making right now to be that sovereign industry that we can be to feed the country and feed ourselves. Great job. Great job, both of you. I mean, I agree with a lot of it. You know, um, holistically, what we're doing is we're fighting all of those isms. We're fighting for more education. We're fighting against corporate greed. But what we do in an overall perspective is basically try to build relationships where corporations have more heart to give to more people, to have, have more you know, um, sympathy for the farmers that are helping feeding them. I mean, 90% of the food in Indiana is imported you know, 60% of it comes from California. With a drought like they're having, or well, and rain and everything else they're having out there, how is that going to affect us when we don't have a sustainable system, right? right? So how, how is that going to help us when we're not with climate change? Why aren't we, you know, having more high tunnels? Why aren't we having more greenhouses where we can grow more food throughout that? But that's access, you know, that that's access and access to not only up to break the barriers to break policies and to increase um, knowledge and overall collaborations because overall, you know, working together is going to help us. Why aren't these big corporations, we talk about these 250, 350,000 combine, why aren't there a, a combine share program? Mm -hmm. why, is there, why isn't there some program where farmers can say, hey, we need this combine to come to our farm three days a week, how can we schedule it? Why are there so more collaboration at the state level rather than the money going to the you know education um, education institutions, the, the state into institutions, and basically middle and man millions of dollars where those that millions of dollars can go directly to the farmers so they can have a bit larger impact. When it comes to food sovereignty, all of that plays a part of it. If you don't have access to land, if you don't have access to good policy. That's all going to be barriers to us creating a better system. So every day we fight all of it. And I, if, if you're a farmer, you wear four or five hats. You know what I'm saying? And we understand it. But what we need to do is have more access to people to help us outsource some of the work so we can focus more on feeding our country. There seems to be, I feel like the theme of today, especially in this food space, is a lot of talk about importing of food, right, in areas of which food is being grown. Um, and I would love to really kind of hear about your visioning as in the work that you're actually doing to localize the food system within your community um, and what those kind of um, collaborations look like but what does the work of bringing that localized food system, um, how does that, is, how is that represented in your work? Woo, you set me up, okay? <laughs> you talk about Grand Slam? Thank you very much. So how does that show up? 
a cooperative of people came together in order to create a safe space. We decided that our children should be very comfortable at a farmer's market, seeing farmers like them, people who care about their future and want to invest in them. But I, what I love about that question is how is it showing up? It's showing up in Ellettsville and radiating out. It's radiating out to Human Agricultural Cooperative. It's radiating out to Legacy Taste of the Garden. But they keep their sovereignty, and we keep ours. And so there's this beautiful relationship occurring. When people come to People's Market every Saturday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., <laughs> 2420 East 3rd Street, Bloomington, Indiana, they come there. And they are welcomed. They are invited in to investing locally. We offer a sliding scale. One tomato could be between a dollar and five dollars. Most people pay 10. Because they understand what every one of those dollars is doing. How that one dollar is going to pay for ballet lessons, how that one dollar is sending kid to 4-H, how that extra dollar you paid is translating into a mom who's a part of Black Lives Matter, who's been getting $75 worth of food every week for the past three years from us. No question asked. So to create that relationship, it really honors all of the relationships that came before us. Everyone in here was fed by someone else before you could feed yourself. Somebody else prepared your food, and we can do that for others. We do that by collecting donations. We do that by getting and working with farmers who are interested in feeding other people. And what it translated into was a million dollar grant. What it translated into is Farm Aid. Farm Aid is an affirmation of nearly five seasons. We call them seasons, because the drama is high. Drama. We call them seasons. So this is the fourth season of us asking for repair, right? For our farmer's market, for our city to acknowledge the work that we've been doing not for them, but for our community to understand that accountability is something we can all take part in. It's not about punishment. We want to bring you back in so that you, your family, and your community are starting to produce food. We need to all become producers. That is the issue. We keep trying to outsmart, outthink, outfund a reality. Each and every person in this room you and I are farmers. We farm. How many more people can we incite joy with by farming together? And that's where those cooperative principles come in. One of my favorite is care for community because it invites us to share the joy we get when you dig up your first sweet potato. I cried, I don't know what you did. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> when your first sweet potato vine has a purple Flower, do you know this purple flower? Have you seen what I'm talking about? That's enough, the ochre flower, that's enough to share joy. And so it's showing up in deeper relationships and collaborations that throughout the state of Indiana, we're starting a cooperative of black farmers. You can clap now, go ahead. Uh, uh. Go ahead. So that our farmers, not just the ones that we've already in relationship with, are fully aware of the empowerment that's available to them by doing it as a cooperative. You see how it's a cooperative over and over and over again? Okay. Well, where has it shown up? Like Lauren said, it's us starting with $40 on a little plot um, to writing million dollar grants. It's from us starting from that little plot and teaching hundreds of young people how to farm. Um, it's from that little plot that we work with over 500 farmers throughout the nation to create a better food system for Indiana. Because we know that the 1% in Indiana is not going to be able to help feed the, the totality of our, our population. So you have to create those, those collaborations. And to do opposite of what history has taught, to, to be inclusive. Woo. To be <laughs> inclusive. Woo. I mean, I'm, I mean, we're head of a, 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 a large grant here in the state that says that we could have all black farmers. But we, what we did was we said, that's not going to solve anything. That's going to perpetuate the system that's already going. So not only do we have black farmers, IPOC farmers, women farmers, you know, gay farmers, you know, white farmers, we're all a collective, cooperative, and we'll bring in 
even with our black cooperative, we're going to bring in other farmers to assist because we know we can't do it by ourselves. It's going to be together we're better and stronger. Okay? That, that's going to be the thing for us forever because it build, you, you can build better together. Okay? And, and, and the reason, and, and it's, it's about open, being open, about being honest. And, and some people say I might be a little blunt. <laughs> Just, you know, I don't got time for no games. Okay? I don't have time for any games about the food access and food system and food insecurity. I don't have time. I'm not an old man, but I'm not a young man either. Okay? So I don't have time. You know, I'm here to, to do the work, get it done, feed as many people as I can, gather people along the way that have the same heart, mm -hmm. that has the same feeling to want to change the narrative that has been happening in America for the last few, few, gen few, you know, few centuries. <laughs> you know, I mean, but it starts today. Each and every one of you are a new advocate for change. Today, I empower every one of you. You are an advocate for change. Reach out to your mama, your sister, your cousin, and tell them, hey, we need to empower and champion all farmers, no matter what color, no matter what they're doing. Okay? Thank you all. Wow, how do I follow that? <laughs> that was amazing. And like you said, uh, we are stronger together. Uh, well, my and my uh, company, call it, organization, what we do is we fight to save the wetlands, the water, have water rights, um, and we build those coalitions and we build those communities with, and I, I call them communities because they are families. When you work together through communities along the Gulf South, and we also work with Puerto Rico, because it is part of the Gulf and they are a colonized nation. Um, <clears throat> One of the things we do, and I speak on colonization, we have to get away from that colonized mind that we have been brought up with, that for every action you have to have an outcome. Why can't we just act? Why can't we just grow? Why can't we just feed? We um, no data. Right. Exactly. We just know what's going on. We learn from indigenous ways, indigenous practices. They didn't have all the computers and stuff that we have now. They just knew because it was taught. And if we learn from our elders, we know where to step. You, learn how, you have to learn how to walk from your elders. For sure. So why can't we learn how to do the things right with communities from those who came before us, our elders? And my organization <clears throat> follow indigenous practices and in everything they do. When we build coalitions, when we build community. Um, another thing that we do, and I'd like to, we, we write legislation to help mm. save our wetlands and our water and gain water access rights. And a piece of legislation, um, <clears throat> Kendra just is putting in front of legislation. She started an all women's organization to help yeah. commercial yeah. fishermen. Let's go. Um, and we're building those communities and we're sh sharing knowledge through organizations and building that out so we can help our community of fishermen all along the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. Because it starts in your community and it never has to be a NIMBY situation because it will be a NIMBY situation if you don't stop it. And NIMBY is not in my backyard, mm. but I feel the Gulf South is my backyard, just like Indiana is my backyard because it, the food comes from here and, comes, and goes down there. Definitely. Our seafood comes from our place and comes up here. Exactly. So it is my backyard. So I don't like that NIMBY, <laughs> NIMBY deal. And what we want to do is thrive. All we want to do is thrive. And that's why we build these coalitions. That's why we build these committees and family and community <clears throat> to help people understand that just because we do have hurricanes, we do have sea level rise, but there is something that we can do to save our wetlands, save our water and save our land. And that it's just starting to have that conversation. Just have that conversation with your neighbor of what can I do? What, not what do you need? Where can I help? Come on. Come on. Come on. I knew I was going to be excited about this panel. <laughs> um, I would like to, one of the things that I think has kind of been touched on a bit, and I'm going to, selfishly, I'm asking this question because um, 
as the great philosopher Whitney Houston once said, I believe the children are the future. I believe the children. <laughs> um, I think we, I would love to hear about how you guys engage youth, especially um, in an intergenerational term, right? We talk a lot about education. Um, and we talk a lot about, I've been able to witness personally the power of seeing children that don't have access to a grocery store grow food, witness that flower that you were talking about, and really be able to taste what it feels like um, to be present in growing food, right? So I would love to hear, because I believe all of you do work with youth, correct? Um, I would love to hear how you work towards engaging youth and educating them on where their food comes from. In a lot of ways, I'm starting in the womb. <laughs> So I also am a birth worker, and I'm intentionally sending them local and organic food. So even out, we ain't even out the womb yet, <laughs> and I'm already convincing them that it tastes better and it's fresher. Um, and we do that by creating meals for folks that people can get a hold of. We deliver to a shelter for domestic violence victims, and so those families have one less thing to think about the children there go to a fridge and the sign says, the farmers grew this for you. So it's very clear, right, that we're thinking of them. Um, they're not abstract to us. And then some of the other work I'm doing is at Benjamin Banneker Center. Please, please Google Benjamin Banneker. This man, whoo, what he did was create the almanac, the thing that we all look at and we go by that's what he did. And so at the Benjamin Banneker Center, it's in Bloomington, it was one of the first black schools. We talk a lot about Juneteenth. I mean, it just happened, so everybody was thrilled. Juneteenth, what does that mean for our youth? They start recognizing that they're a part of our liberation. That in fact, how they're visioning the world is a part of that liberation. And so when I talk to those students and I read the stories, it's fascinating because my husband and I will bring the lambs to the Banneker Center or the library and children that we've decided are just too busy and they doing too much are now calm and very certain that they're gonna be sheep farmers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely certain. Uh, because the lamb t connects with them without any words. And in our human highly m thought driven world, um, seeing the students connect without any words really drives that visioning. Because I understand that we're going to have to communicate and educate and empower in ways that aren't so straightforward. So bringing our sheep and talking a lot, and advocating a lot for farmers to use small animals, to not start with buying soil, buying fertilizer, but actually to create husbandry and create relationships with animals who are always benefiting us. I mean, it's very much this way. We do very little that way. And so knowing that that's a relationship that the youth can begin with. And then I mentor. There are a few students, one of which I have to shout out. Isa Smith, love you. She absolutely took on all of my demands <laughs> and came to the farm and used her education to launch her career. And so to watch her grow and to see her expand her definition of student to farmer, from farmer Come to on. producer, from producer to advocate, that's really how I'm seeing the seeds mm -hmm. create that harvest. Yes. Mm. Uh, as a child, I grew up on my father's boat. Uh, when we were old enough to walk, I was his deckhand. Um, and that's all across our community because uh, it was hard to pay someone to work for us, so the family worked for each other. And um, at six years old, I was on the boat. At nine months, I fell off the boat, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> but how we engage our youth is from... Like you said, the womb. We're born into this. But how do we educate other youth is 
we have camps. We have, well, everybody likes Zoom calls these days. So um, we get our, our youth classes twice a week. You get on a Zoom call during homework. They help you with your homework for school. They also teach us uh, the, our youth about cultural knowledge, their cultural heritage, and just asking questions of what do you, where do you see yourself next year? Ten years old, ten year olds don't know where they're going to be in two two months, but you you give them that thought, you plant that seed of thought of where you're going to be in a little while, and show them that there is something to do in the future. My wife, the Bioneers program takes Indigenous youth and they do cross cultural collaborations with youth uh, that are in high school to teach them about other cultures, about what other cultures do, their history, their culture, the farmers, the fishermen, um, and lets our youth know that there's a bigger world outside of your PS5. <laughs> and that Zoom call, and it helps them grow by seeing that there are other children around the world that are interested in things that are similar and like-minded. And believe me, it is not an echo chamber because every child has a, f a way of thinking. They already built that self-knowledge and who they are. So it's, it's helpful that it is not an echo chamber, that they can learn about other cultures and other indigenous practices and in other ways of the world. Uh, and what's good about that high school age is that's the gray area in children. It's where they have to make the hardest decision in their life. Before, before high school, you never have to make a decision your clothes are put out for you when you go to school. <laughs> Mom and dad makes your decisions. After you graduate, you have to figure it out. But at that precious area, 11th, 12th grade before you graduate, that is a, a magical time in a child's life. That's where the hardest decisions are made of, am I going to turn left or am I going to turn right? What is, what is my next steps? Mm -hmm. And by working with me and my wife working with these children, I see it makes those decisions easier because we lay out a path for them and it's up to them to take that road and make those decisions easier. It starts young. When you have a plant, you have to care for it and nurture it or it will die and dry up. Children are the same. If you don't nurture it and protect it and allow them to make their own course, they'll dry up. And I see that by watering and feeding our youth knowledge that it takes and also teaching them about their history and their culture helps them grow to be as strong as an oak. Well, I have a different narrative. Um, not a generational farmer, um, basically city kid. Uh, you know that little plant you guys got in third grade? Mine died, okay? Mine died, okay, all right? So what I, I what we teach is basically from where we uh, where we pretty much grew up inner city, you know. Uh, as a young, as a black man, I, I have a probably a totally different dynamic of life and narrative than most of you. Um, so I teach them from a perspective of being the underdog. Mm -hmm. I, I I really do because um, the teacher student mm -hmm. or farmer teacher dynamic is always going back and forth, yin and yang. Our, our youth teaches uh, us and we teach them mm. because the biggest thing about nurturing or you know nurturing young people is nurture their interests okay we we emphasize that everyone needs to grow food I don't care if you're an engineer yeah. a scientist mm. everyone needs to learn how to grow food right but we harness what you want to be if you want to be a musician if you want to be a lawyer, I, we pair you with whoever you want to be. Because the, the biggest thing is educating them about themselves mm -hmm. so they can be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have a youth farming program every year, we do education tables, we do community uh, events throughout the year, um, we give away food, we have, they grow their food, they, well, from I tell people, we do seed to retail. We teach them how to seed bank, grow their food, market their food, identify their food, sell their food to the community, and also cook their food. So we have all of those you know, points that we do um, because if they know from A to Z, 
right? It gives them more opportunity to do what's right or do what's good for them. Mm-hmm. And it do, when you do good for yourself, you do good for the, the collective group, okay? So when youth programs, food giveaways, and then what we've been doing for the last few years is we've been having a share the harvest, right? Most farming communities at the end of the season, at the end of the crops, what they did was they brought in crops from each farm, they cooked it, they had fun, they had music, they had good conversation, and that's what we want to get back to, bring in the community with unity. There's no community without unity. I mean, I know we've heard all that, all these cliches, but it's, it's so real. So what we're going to do today is I'm inviting each and every one of you to share the harvest, Fort Wayne, Indiana, October 21st. You better plug. <laughs> from 2 to 8, uh, you're all invited. You can RSVP on Posh today. Today. Thank you. I would love to take a moment to, I know after we all actually eat together and break bread and whatnot, um, we're going to be shifting and thinking about the, the farm bill. Um, and we hear a lot about access. I, I keep hearing that word come up a lot. Um, and I want to challenge us to actually think about federal policy here for a minute. Um, in particular, and this is the angle that I'm coming from, right? Mm -hmm. Even just on this panel alone, there are people that uh, grow food to produce and uh, get profits. And there are people that produce food to feed their community, right? Um, What are some policies that you would like to see move forward to help both of those groups of people to be able to produce food for our communities. Oh, I'm ready. Okay, come on now. I'm ready. (laughs) Most of it is barriers within FDA, USDA, in the paperwork to actually provide more access to farmers and advocates, right? But also, we want to go against clone meat, okay? We want to we, we 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 want to act we want to we want to give more rights to ranchers with the Prime Act, okay? All right, all right. You know, with the, you know, be, because the whole thing about it is, if we keep creating these barriers for food access, that's what you're going to have more barriers, right? If 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 we, for example, how hard is it for you to get your chickens to the poultry or to get your it, we need mobile units. We need, we need more access to, to processing for the value-added products at the end. Because, come on. Specifically come for on. smaller farmers. We call, they laugh. 12, please, right? 12 animals, get out of here. They brag about 30,000 head, right? When our farmers drop off a CSA bag, that is delicious, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's not a pallet. You're right. It's not, but it's heirloom. These seeds, these, the community that gets them, they could save them, mm-hmm. right? We're shifting our mentality around the human pace, but then we have to think about the human capacity. Do I need 30,000 head to be a farmer? Is that the requirement? Th- those are the barriers. The paperwork is the barriers. I can speak from my privilege, right? I went to a women's college, hello. There's privilege there. And so even the paperwork, having the FSA loan application from 37 pages down to 22, those are the kinds of decisions that policies can really shift when there's not so much required on the farmer. As a BIPOC farmer, we could receive 100% of our funding up front, unrestricted. 100%. Unrestricted, did I say that? Unrestricted. Unrestricted. So that we can determine that sovereignty and we can take the funds that our ancestors did not receive and translate it into the farmers we all need. On top of that, we don't need someone to administer these grants to us. I don't need an overseer. I don't need another boss. I know exactly where every dollar I have to go to my farm. Oh, 
You're the boss. Oh, <laughs> we don't need someone to basically take 20, 30 percent off the top to allow us to administrate a program that we've been doing for decades. Mm. When you add that that level uh, that that layer of administration, what that does is it causes conflicts, it con causes division, it causes less funding for a program that needs it rather than someone that's sitting in some office dictating what's going on. Mm. We need more access directly to the funding. We need more direct access to the USDA. We need more direct access to our state representatives. We need more access to our senators to actually push these bills. So you can talk about any bill that you want, but if you don't have their backing, it's going to go nowhere. So we have to pull them in, pull them in to assist us and assist themselves. I think at the federal level, the Justice for Black Farmers Act is a great example. People's Market uses that to hold our board accountable. It overcompensates. 75% of our board are BIPOC people. And that is because of the Justice for Black Farmers Act. It gave us an outline to create an equitable conversation so that some voices that have been centered can take a break. And then voices that have not been centered can be in the middle and share authority. So the last part that I want to say is the shared authority part. If you are unaccustomed to a highly educated black woman being your boss, <laughs> then you might, we might need to talk about what it means for you to talk and to deal with the power dynamic there and to understand your history so we can liberate each other from the segregation that capitalism wants us to believe in. Uh, yeah, you know, that that's definitely right. I work with a coalition back in Louisiana called Louisiana for a Green New Deal. And we have a team right now, probably right now, working on concessions to be put in the form bill for climate justice and racial justice. Let's go. I mean, <clears throat> you look at all these ustuses, they're all connected. You can't speak, with, speak about one without speaking about the other. And the farm bill has to put that in directly because it directly impacts families. It directly impacts black farmers. You know, um, those concessions need to be put in there alone, not just a, a mush bill or uh, how they say, just a slop fund. We don't need that. We need direct action when it comes to climate justice and racial justice in the farm bill. Now we're limited on time and I like to respect time because uh, I know we're all hungry and we want to move our bodies. Um, I would like to create space for perhaps a question, but I want you to be mindful of time, right? Attitude. And attitude. Oh. <laughs> I'm just repeating. No, I'm not. I feel that to my core. Um, but I want us to be mindful of time and space, right? So if we could kind of get to the question uh, to offer everyone, because I would like to maybe get one or two questions going. Um, so be mindful of time and space. Hi, I'm Andrew with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. We work out there. Hey. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this one question. It's going to be right after my little rant. We um, have issues with communications with farmers. A lot of these farmers don't have internet connection. They don't, you know, have cell phone connection that's reliable. And so whenever we feed them this information about what's going on in these other states, like Indiana, South Carolina and stuff like that. They're like, well, I don't believe you, show me. So my thing is, is that I want to get everyone's here's number or phone office or something so that way I can share it with my farmers and show them that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. And show them that these people have overcome it and so can you, you can overcome it and be brighter and be successful just like these people are. So please don't hesitate, contact me, Andrew Fuller once again. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a question, but you find those farmers where they're at. 
You you find them. You find you. Hey, you handwrite that number to them. You you text them. You email them. You snail mail them. Whatever you got to do, you get it to them. Hi, I'm Sharon Kennedy, and I'm from North Carolina, representing North Carolina Catch and our supper tables. And um, first of all, I, during COVID, we had visitors, as I live on an island, we call them strangers. They're tourists, but we call them strangers. <laughs> and yes. during COVID, all these people from up north were coming to our island because we're, we're cool there, and it's low key. And they were wiping our grocery shelves off, stocking up, where we, you know, buy a loaf of bread a day, but they were buying the whole shelf. Our fishermen were able to go out and catch food for us to eat on our island. Technically, under regulations, it was illegal because they can't even go catch fish and give it to their neighbor without it being tagged. So fishermen were feeding us. I came up last year with Farm Aid that no farmers, no fishers, there's no food. We are the procurers of our food systems. Our government, our state, uh, federal government, as uh, Mr. Dave from uh, Kendall said, needs to invest in our infrastructure. And he hit real close of our NAFTA imports versus our exports. On my island, we are hit with recreational oppositions. They're game fishers, and they want our fish houses to be marinas with restaurants so they can go trophy fish. We fish for food, not pleasure. Also, the fact is, is they have lawyers in their midst. We are only fishermen, and they're always at the legislators. So NC Catch did a thing, and we went... We were having legislator dinners in Raleigh, inviting all the legislators to come eat fresh local North Carolina seafood prepared by fishermen. Boy, did we get their attentions. And they liked it. You're right. Educating through feeding, teaching is imperative. But our federal government needs to invest in your farms, our small farms, our fishermen, so that on our island, you can pass four or five seafood trucks bringing seafood to Cape Hatteras when we're one of the largest destinations of uh, diverse species. Why can't I have my own bluefish from my backyard? Why do I have to have it from elsewhere? Our federal government needs to invest in their local commodity, which is their citizens preparing and trying to feed our own selves. We don't want handouts. It wasn't a question, but I Facts. still want to address it because what you're describing is not something I don't know anything about. Like what you just described is the frustration that our farmers are trying to deal with with our mobile units. So how we would address that is Ty would get a truck and that mobile unit would come to the farms in his area and they would work cooperatively to do that. We in the South would bring all of our investors up to his event Right, and then we'd get investors from Legacy, from Daniel's Garcia's Gardens, different people to collaborate with you. They got lawyers, we got people. That's right. They have lawyers, but we have people. And so we can protest, we can sit in on these conversations, we can rotate our county and state official meetings and sit and watch because being a witness is a powerful thing. To witness what they're doing is how we can inform and be strategic so that we can cooperate. That is the answer to their lawyers, cooperating. Also, create your own watchdog groups. That I mean, accountability, it, it, groups. accountability groups. If, if, you're, if, the, if you're not holding them accountable, they're going to keep doing the same thing they're going to do to you. You know what I'm saying? They're going to keep walking over you. They're going to keep pushing your rights to the side. You have to make them accountable. Stand up. Okay, so my name is Hallie Wettstein Means. I am an ag teacher um, in a super tiny town in very far western Kansas. Um, and we are a population that is about 60% Hispanic, 40% um, white. And um, I 
really struggle with getting my students to buy in because I look like your traditional everyday cover art farmer. Um, and I don't want to bring them to the table, but I want to bring the table to them. And so my question is how can I, as the majority, be respective of the minority, but also be helpful and be a resource for them that is impactful? I love your question. You are already doing Honestly, it. Honestly, pay teachers more. Did I say that yet? <laughs> Honestly, like what? Wow. Okay, because that was the question. How to these places? I know right now a professor who asked me this question, how can I not be uh, a deterrent to my brown students? And it's stepping aside. It's saying I don't need to be at the center of this conversation. I need to get some funding first and have right an offering to your Hispanic community, like you said, to invite your students in. Because they already have the culture, they already have the community, and they want your students involved, you're that bridge. Hmm. You're, the bridge you're the bridge to say, I don't know, and therefore I'm gonna go find out. What's your recommendation or would you have two choices? Oh, hi. Yeah! yeah. Yeah, so take them with you. Take oh. them with you. <laughs> Every time you go in that community, take them with you to demonstrate that you don't know it all, that this community is fully aware of what they can teach and empower that community. Sometimes I like to tell my friends who are not of the global majority, who are not a part of the global majority, that they have so much social equity. You can ask for things that I cannot ask for. You're in rooms that I cannot go into. And girl, you can flip those tables in Use those rooms. Use your power. Oh. Use your power. Ask the hard questions and really decide that you're already anti-racist. Just decide it. Be like, I'm already doing it, and this is what it looks like. And not just that. Just to add on that is get in these races, these campaigns. Oh. Create campaigns. Oh, get in government. Create oh, those no. campaigns. Work for yourself. Don't, don't, if they're not going to listen to you, make them listen to you by running. In Louisiana, our ag has been, this is a second term, He's run a post twice. We need that to change. Mm -hmm. We have a super majority in Louisiana because 58 senators ran unopposed. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't win, you create the conversation that, that this person is doing wrong. Get in those races. Even if it's from school board all the way to the Senate, Come governor's on. race. Come Get on. in those races. Come on. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Make, don't just make the change. Be the change yeah. you want to see in that community and, and do those races. And I think you should run next year. Literally, think <laughs> about it. The last thing I'll say, too, is just a quick exercise. And we can all do it. We can all close our eyes if that's comfortable for you. And it's something I do with my students a lot. Think about the last meal that you had, so all the different components of that meal. And I want you to imagine back to someone picking that thing before it was prepared. That's the hands somebody who was watering it, watching it, there are more hands. Somebody who absolutely prepped the soil way before seeds were there, there are more hands where that put the seed into the ground. There are so many hands along the way to your plate. And we can always imagine how those human hands bring us together. Last thing, <laughs> when you said, how can I, interact with that community, get someone who's already interacting with the community. Partner with somebody who's already doing the work. You don't, you don't have to recreate the wheel. You don't, have, you, don't have to control the, you don't have to control the narrative. Someone's already doing it. Get in that passenger seat and start a driver's seat. Exactly. Woo, seat. Sit next to them. Learn. Learn how to communicate. Learn how to change, go through that, those generational or, or racial barriers. You know, learn that part because that is more genuine. Genuine. That's more organic than forcing yourself into something. Mm -hmm. You got it. You just just that question alone. You're ready for it. Totally. Embrace it. Totally. All right. Oh, so good. You're welcome. One more. Or One more wanna? question. One more. Okay. I will be five seconds, and that is that earlier y'all said that y'all have people but not lawyers, and I am Jessica Culpepper. I'm the executive director of Farmstand, and we are your lawyers. Let's hey. <laughs> I was wrong. We got people no, and lawyers. People and lawyers. People and lawyers. I need it. Okay. 
Whoo, man, that was so good. Thank you for that. I'm so glad we created space for that. Um, we are at time, but I would like to create space, and that's what I'm going to task y'all with uh, one sentence on how you want us to move forward in this work towards food sovereignty. Let's cooperate. Let's cooperate. Well, our motto is together we're better and stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, like you said, work together. The, the divisiveness is by design. Um, I want to thank you all. I knew, I knew this was going to be so good. I'm so grateful to be present about this. Um, I hope everyone in here was able to take something and feel as fed as I feel right now as before we actually get fed. Uh, thank you, Farm Aid, for uh, offering us the opportunity to have this thank dialogue. Thank you, Farm Aid. Um, truly, truly, thank you so much. Ain't you glad that Justin showed up? I, I wanna go Thank you. All right, as we as we go into lunch, if I can have your attention just for a minute. As we go into lunch, I want you to I think they left us on a on a beautiful and grand note. We're not sitting in this space just um, by accident. There's some intent behind us all being together today. So I want us to just kind of imagine what we can do together in this space. This is just a day, you know, but there's an opportunity to do so much more after we leave this space today. I think about how Farm Aid started with the message coming from um, this one artist who had this huge platform, Willie Nelson. And, I, and tell me if I'm wrong, Carolyn, or OGs in the room, Mr. Center, or other folks. You know, a lot of, uh, as we come to Indiana, as we move around the country, as we hear from farmers who were, who were there back in the day, I call them OGs, respectfully. <laughs> you know, they say that Willie came to them and he came to their rescue, but I believe that Mr. Nelson would say the opposite, that those farmers rescued us, you know. So I want us to think about the ways that we can organize together, bigger than this just one platform in one moment, because Farm Aid started in the 80s and I believe strongly that a lot of the impetus and a lot of the characteristics, the foundation of Farm Aid came from other organizers like in the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, etc. So we have a lot of shoulders to build on. So what are we going to do together outside of this space? So as we move into this afternoon, this will be an example of what the possibility is. Okay? And so, um, and then we'll just, we'll party on Saturday. Okay? <laughs> but in the meantime, we got work to do. <laughs> in the meantime, we got work to do. So I see our, um, I see our gracious hosts. Shout out to the Wellington. getting us prepared for uh, supper. Um, so we're gonna take a quick break so you can wash your hands and then, yep, get clean. <laughs> There's a bug going around, if you haven't heard. <laughs> a little bug going around. So um, we're gonna take a, a short break and once, once the food is out, we'll, we'll break bread together and then we'll reconvene. The second half of our day will be um, dedicated to what we're calling the people's hearing. We're going to hear from the people about what a just, racially just, environmentally just farm bill can look like. All right? We in this together? All right. All right. So about, about a 10-minute break, and then we're going to go into lunch, and then we'll get back um, and tell your people we're live. Tell your people we're live. To, so log on to the Farm Aid YouTube channel to tune in. All right? So 10-minute break, and then you'll, we'll get our lunch.
everybody. Food is ready, lunch is ready. So there's a table over here and a table out in the lobby. Make your way to one or the other. If you are hungry, food is ready, and you should grab yourself a plate. If your belly is rumbling, go make yourself a plate. There are two tables, one over here and one out in the lobby.
yeah, they can see her right there, and they can. Oh yeah, I like that. And then nobody necessarily be up here. It's live, yes.
Hello, hello. I'm about to make a really important announcement about credentials. <laughs> okay, folks, some of you have received a credential that looks like this, but it says farmer on it or it says advocate on it. And if you have that credential, you should also have a ticket to the concert tomorrow. Uh, this credential, if you have a ticket to the concert tomorrow, this credential is just for networking. It just allows you to be identified by other farmers and other farmer advocates so you guys can hang out together. There's like a deck um, on the lawn at the venue that you can gather in. Um, so these need to be coupled with a ticket to the concert. If you don't have a ticket to the concert and you have one of these, you could bring it back to us and drop it on our table um, at the check-in desk because we could use them because there are some folks that didn't get these that do have tickets. That's all. Um, I think we're going to kick off our morning after our afternoon uh, session now. Thanks, everybody. Hey y'all, as you as you're finishing up your delicious meal, how about a hand for the for the staff, <laughs> Chef Paul, who did an amazing job preparing our meal, um, mostly locally sourced by Indiana farmers and producers. So if I can have your attention, we want to take a moment. Um, we're going to ask Mr. Don to come up, and we're going to um, he's going to acknowledge a movement leader that we recently lost. And, um, and pay homage to, to her. So if you can give us just a couple minutes and then we'll get into the rest of our program. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Charlotte. I, uh, Kansas and uh, advocate families lost one of their war horses of the 80s, and that was Linda Hessman. So she passed away since the last Farm Aid concert. And uh, back when Willie and David and Corky were trying to figure out how to help family farmers nationally, Linda was driving the dirt road and sitting at the kitchen table. And Linda had an amazing ability over a cup of coffee to get a farmer to talk. And that's a rare talent. <laughs> and she was driving the roads for the Catholic Diocese out of Dodge City, and later on, Catholic Rural Life honored her for that. And uh, anyhow, Linda was a professional mediator. And so she spent years and years doing that. And in the 1990s, I had the honor or responsibility of often working with her on mediations because I was a farm financial analyst for K-State and uh, often we would get signed the same client. And so she would be the mediator and I'd be the number cruncher. And after those good ones, we would talk each other down and cherish the thought that we kept another family on the farm. And after the ones that didn't go so good, we'd kind of cry together a little bit. And so there was that kind of thing. For many years, Linda helped run the Kansas Family Farm Hotline. And so again, in that role, she was saving lives. 
And so she was so special. In 2015, I think, in Chicago, Farm Aid honored Linda for her lifetime of advocacy with a handful of others at that concert. And that meant so much to her. And I was so happy I was there to see it. And uh, she wanted last year in Raleigh to go so bad to one last concert. And I told Linda, I says, if you want to go and your family agrees, we'll get you there. And her health had started deteriorating too fast that it couldn't happen. And so she passed away in December. And, uh, but she was a fireball. And uh, in Kansas Farmers Union, she was on the board before I ever got involved. And she stayed on the board all the way through till just recent years. And she was my champion. I mean, she, she had my back. And I wouldn't have survived several times through things if I didn't have Linda's skill in mediation and, and her willpower in the background. And so she was a dear friend and I miss her. And I just think it's so important that we don't forget the sacrifices that these type of people have made to help their fellow man and to help their farmer neighbors. And uh, we don't want to forget that. We want to respect it and we want to honor it. And so we have all known some lions in our circle of advocates that have passed on. We just don't want to forget them, and I don't want to forget Linda. So thank you. go how about that we all know those lines in our circle of influence so we're gonna pause I come from a tradition where it's important to speak people's names into a room I know who I carry with me everywhere I go so if you want to take a moment to just shout out a name or two that you're carrying with the, with you who may not be on this earthly plane anymore but who rides with you wherever you go that ride or die spirit take a moment right now and do that thank you for that mr. Don so anyone else? Thank you. Just shout out, shout out those names. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charles Sherrod, Adel Ammons, Ammons, Ross, Ammons. <laughs> Thank y'all. Yep. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. Um, um, so we're going to move into the afternoon portion of our program. Um, what am I doing now? I totally <laughs> forgot. Mr. Don, it's all your fault. <laughs> Handing off the mic. Afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Michael with Farm Aid. Um, I'm Charlotte's sidekick. She often uh, tosses me. Uh, this little role where I get to introduce legendary figures in the family farm movement. So it's my privilege uh, to introduce the Reverend David Ostendorf today for uh, this, what are we calling this speech? This is a welcome, it kind of feels like a keynote or something. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, that's the answer. Um, most of you probably know the Reverend Dave uh, is a United Church of Christ minister since 1974. He's been engaged in social, economic, and racial justice organizing across the country. From 1981 
Until 1993, he was executive director of Prairie Fire, Rural Action, a farm and rural organizing group based out of Des Moines, Iowa, and known internationally. At the core of its organizing work, Prairie Fire countered racist and anti-Semitic activity throughout the rural United States. In 1995, he founded and ran until 2012, or uh, directed, the Center for New Community, committed to organizing and leadership development with farm, rural, worker, and religious communities. It's my privilege and pleasure to introduce the Reverend David Ossendorf. Thanks, Michael. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. <clears throat> Excuse me, and this weekend, I mean, we've come from all over the country and we are so um, energized and empowered by everybody being here from every sector of the country, from, from the mountains and the plains, to the south and the north, from the seas and the land. And we can't do this work in the days ahead without every one of you and all the folks that we work with in our respective places. And I also, of course, want to thank Farm Aid and especially Farm Aid staff who are amazing people, right? <laughs> and all the musicians who have made Farm Aid last and work for 38 years. <laughs> and who have given millions of dollars to help all of our neighbors continue their work on the land and in the seas and across the country. We thank you, all of you, and Farm Aid staff. In the harsh winter of 1877, in the thick of a massive blizzard, the great American prophet of freedom, Frederick Douglass, traveled 3,300 miles by train, by carriage, by horseback, ox cart, and I'm sure he walked for three months from New York into Michigan and into eight states in the upper Midwest to carry his message of freedom and racial justice to countless people, 3,300 miles by these tr tremendously ancient ways of travel. And he endured the Jim Crow foolishness of the North that existed in those days to carry that message to new places, to build a base of people who would stand up and fight for racial justice and who left for us and for all peoples a legacy of hope and possibility as he carried that effort out through the challenge to all of us, to all of the people then, to all of us today, to fight for racial justice. I tell you this story because it is a story for our time, because we live in a time of extraordinary challenge, extraordinary challenge, unlike anything I have ever seen in terms of the ex existential challenges that are upon us now, the ongoing realities of racial justice, the struggle, climate change, and the abhorrent two-tier structure of this nation's economy and a two-tier structure of its agricultural system that cannot survive and must not survive. We have to stand up and go after it. And while the farm bill ahead of us is a key part of that effort in the days immediately ahead, we have to look further down the road. We have to look far beyond the farm bill to 2030 and 2040 when children and grandchildren who will follow us and young leaders who will follow us can look back and say that we did everything we could to build a movement, to make sure that the people who come to the concert tomorrow are there for the music, but also for a movement that we have to continue to build and strengthen across this country. These are times when we must move beyond the small pieces, if you will, the important pieces of a farm bill, and look toward how we organize. How do we build across the many 
chasms that separate us from the rest of this country. The powers that be would have every one of us in this room quieted and put aside and in the corners because they don't want to hear about what the people of the land and the seas really are hoping for and struggling for in terms of equity and possibility down the road. We have to organize anew and dig up new relationships and new power to be able to make the changes that are necessary, not just for the near term, but for the long haul as well. There is no reason why all of us in this room are not able and needed to reach out to others in this room to make that effort happen. We have to do it. If you don't know a black farm operator or a black farm organization, you need to get in touch and link with them and organize with them. If you don't know a tribal government <laughs> and the lands that the tribes operate and control, you need to reach out. White Earth, up Ojibwe up in Minnesota, just last week put a prohibition, a prohibition on industrial agriculture within the context of their tribal lands, over 300,000 acres. They stopped. They stopped a 20,000 cow dairy operation planning to be right on the edge of their reservation. You got to know folk like that who are fighting at that level. And we got to build links with them to make sure that their fights are our fights. If you don't know other folks who are working in the seas, know them, they're here. If you don't know folks working in the Northwest or the South, know them, they're here. We are in and we are part of a national effort here that has to continue to build for the long haul. And even though we sometimes feel that we're not making much progress, we have to know that these small steps are absolutely essential. Don't organize for what happens next week. Everything you organize, think about how it affects and builds on for the next year and decade, because that's the way we have to look. We have to create a new vision, a new sense of possibility with our people, because if we don't, we might as well just have a nice concert tomorrow and go home. <laughs> I'm serious. Our people, our peoples, have been in trouble for a long time. Back in the 80s, we linked up and built a strong base with the black farmers of the South and the white farmers in the Midwest. And it was always great because the black farmers of the South said, farm crisis, what are you talking about? We've been in crisis our whole lives. <laughs> our generations, we've been in crisis. And now you all in the North, all you white farmers are figuring out there's a crisis out there. And so we had to build together. Jerry Pennick and I did salt and pepper, you can figure it out, <laughs> presentations <laughs> across the country talking about this reality. If you don't know a black farmer, if you don't know a white farmer, you don't know organizers, get to know them. Because unless we work together, we'll get no place. Our tribal brothers and sisters have faced this reality since the Europeans first landed on this continent. And it's critical that we are in their struggles as well around pipelines and around land preservation and around land reacquisition. It's crucial that we support that effort. The struggle we are in, my friends, is a long-term struggle. And there are many who have gone before us, indeed, who can help us understand what we have to do. And we have to learn from that history. We have to learn from the strategies and tactics that some of the old timers used to be able to adapt them for the late 20, 20th and early 21st century. We have to work with organized labor, my friends. We have to work with organized labor. In the 80s, UAW members who built farm implements in Iowa and across the country were on strike, and we supported them as farm organizations. We need to look at what's happening right now. Harmel workers are looking to strike. 
we need to look at where we can build with organized labor because so many of the people who work in the plants are also farmers and they have to be part of this struggle and we have to be part of their struggle. We have to work with women's organizations to be able to build the power that women bring to this movement. Back in those days, we had women's conferences bring four or 500 women together to talk about and to build solidarity in this struggle for the long haul. We have to work to make sure that workers themselves in plants and factories are treated justly. We gotta stop this awful effort now at happening at many state levels to permit child labor. It's awesomely awful. Iowa has done this, 14 and 15 year olds can work now. And so, just last week another kid, an immigrant kid, working in a cleaning crew at a Tyson plant, got maimed and hurt, as has happened many times over in the past several years. They kind of bring the kids in to clean up overnight and hopeful, hopeful that they won't get hurt or poisoned by the chemicals they have to use. This is outrageous, my friends. It is outrageous, and if we have any connection, we must use it. If we don't have a connection, we must bring it up and build on it for justice for those kids. My friends, it is a incredibly challenging time that lies ahead of us. And while I hope and know that you, that we, will give everything we possibly can to make sure that this upcoming farm bill advances as far as we possibly can the kinds of rights and visions and possibilities we see for our family farmers. We have to make sure that we're looking far beyond that farm bill, that we're looking across this room and across this country to others who struggle with us, and that we build a level of movement and possibilities that has political power and voice there is no reason why Frederick Douglass could travel like that in the midst of this harshest period of time and do what he did. And we can't do something like that. We can't mount campaigns to put speakers and people in the cities and the suburbs from the countryside and tell our stories, They'll tell the stories of our people so that the relationships are built that are so critical to the success of our organizing. Organizing is not just about power. It is about building relationships, my friends. Building relationships. And if you build relationships with others, especially those who share in the struggle with us, there is a sense, there's a possibility that we will in fact achieve the kinds of changes, perhaps even in our lifetime that we seek to, to achieve. We are, my friends, part of a long thread of folk on the land and in many other places who have struggled for generations and lifetimes to bring about the possibility of justice in their time and in our time. We need to make sure that we tap the roots and the stories of those folk. Sometimes people ask me along the way, what do you do? You're an organizer. What does that mean? It means I'm a story carrier. Every one of you are story carriers. And you have to carry the stories of your people and our people into places that haven't heard those stories to build relationships that will seek and achieve levels of power that we hope for. It's interesting, you know, we've got, we got Moms for Liberty, I think they're called. I shouldn't even mention their names. They're seeking to ban books, right? I say ban corporate food from our schools. Yeah. Ban Tyson chicken from coming into our cafeterias. Feed the kids good food and feed all the kids. Minnesota last year passed legislation and paid for 
feeding every kid for this coming year free lunches in schools. And we produce the food they need. Why aren't we working with the schools? Why aren't we pushing and moving forward on every possible place we possibly can to make sure that our kids get fed? I know every one of you have packed calendars. Believe me, I know that. You wonder what you're going to do? How can you possibly use another hour beyond the 14 or 15 hours you put in right now? I'm telling you that you've got to figure out a way to make sure you're doing that, to spread this effort as far as you possibly can to build on the threads of the past that have given us the sense of possibility out there, even in the most dire times. This struggle goes way back. Sometimes we don't think that's true. The Hebrew prophet, you've heard of him, Isaiah. Isaiah said, you who add house to house, and field to field, until there's no room for anyone but you. Isaiah said, you're left to live alone in the midst of the land. Isaiah said that, Isaiah said that generations ago. This is the warning from long ago that still lingers before us, that we have to put a stop to in every way we possibly can. It is a call that we have as a people committed to justice and equality, to racial justice, and to hope for all God's people on this planet, for all of the people in our neighborhoods and towns and villages. Feed the people. House the people. Help the people. Do everything you possibly can to make sure that when folk look back upon us and this time, they can say, you know what? They did everything they possibly could to make sure that they tried their best to create this new country, this new sense of possibility, to build underneath the awesome existential challenges we face, to build underneath all of this terrible, terrible reality that intrudes on our world and on our lives and on our people, to make sure that we built underneath all of this the sense of possibility and justice for all the people down the roads. My friends, that is our task. Not just the Farm Bill, but also the Farm Bill. Not just a concert, not just the music, but a movement. And so every one of you, every one of you, every one of you, all of us together have to do this. We have to help create and make real a vision of a new country, a new possibility for all the people to help unleash the waters of justice that they may flow over our lands and over our people and over our villages and towns and over our farms and all the places where we live and where we call home that indeed might be our place and the people's place for all of our neighbors to live well and justly and equitably and equally upon the land that we are given. May it be so, my friends. May it be so. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Lori Mercer. I'm one of um, Farm Aid's hotline team members. And if that intrigues you, if you're not familiar with the hotline or the Farmer Services Program, I would invite you to come visit us tomorrow. We'll be at the Homegrown Village at the festival. Uh, we'll have a Farm Aid stand there and we would love to chat with you, hear your stories and see how we might be able to support you and come alongside of you. So I, it's my pleasure now to introduce Sherry Duggar as the moderator of our 2023 Farm Aid People's Hearing on the Farm, Farm Bill. 
With nearly two decades of experience editing magazines and books, Sherry Duggar now puts her media and public relations experience to work in the agricultural field. Currently serving as executive director of the Socially, Respo Socially Responsible Agriculture Project, Duggar has also served as executive director of both Women, Food, and Agricultural Network and Indiana Farmers Union, and as a policy and communications consultant for American Grass-Fed Association. She co-chairs a national coalition, U.S. Farmers and Ranchers for a Green New Deal, an advocate for local and regional food systems, environmental sustainability, humane animal agriculture, and diversified family farming. She also frequently lobbies at the Indiana State House and on Capitol Hill. Duggar is a member of the National Agricultural Advocacy Council for the Humane Society of the United States, and she reestablished the Midwest Sustainable Agricultural Working Group in early 2019. Duggar is currently pursuing a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Indianapolis, and when she isn't working, studying, or traveling, she enjoys life on a small farm in Morristown, Indiana, with her husband, Randy, and their dogs, cats, donkeys, goats, alpacas, chickens, and honeybees. Sherry, there she is, welcome. Yeah. Hello everyone. Um, lots of familiar faces in the room. It's lovely to see you all here and I hope that I, the faces that I have not yet met, I, I soon do. But I am Sherry Duggar. I'm the Executive Director of Socially Responsible Agriculture Project. I'm lucky enough, I have no idea how they managed it, but the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project is right here at these two tables. So I feel well supported uh, by my team members. They are my heroes for sure. Um, uh, also known as SRAP, uh, Socially Responsible Agriculture Project mobilizes communities to protect themselves from uh, incoming industrial agriculture operations or expanding industrial agri agriculture operations or livestock uh, production facilities. Um, we're working to protect public health, environmental quality, um, rural economies, and, and um, communities from these uh, damaging impacts of industrial livestock production and, and to support uh, independent farmers, um, rural residents, and, and uh, uh, the environment. So our team includes technical experts, uh, independent farmers themselves, and also rural residents who have actually faced these operations coming in so they know firsthand what, what these uh, impacts of these operations are. Um, when asked for help, we offer free support to these communities, um, providing them with knowledge and skills and toolkits to be able to um, organize, as David talked about, and, and um, to fight back and to realize, in, in essence, their power against these operations and against the industry. Uh, we see firsthand the negative impacts of these uh, consolidated and corporate controlled um, industrial operations and, and the, the system as a whole on human lives, on the environment, on animals, uh, public health, et cetera. Um, it's an honor to be here today. I am actually a born and bred Hoosier, so uh, welcome to my home state. I live uh, on a farm, as she mentioned, in Spencer, Indiana, and I'm, um, it's a joy to, to you know, see farm aid come back to, to our state. Um, I hope throughout the week, as you are today, um, able to break bread with some of Indiana's amazing uh, food system workers and farmers and, and farm workers, et cetera. We have a lot of really great folks here. Um, before I begin, I want to actually thank everyone at Farm Aid for asking me to do this and uh, for also organizing this event. This is an incredible show of uh, organization and collaboration and cooperation between uh, Farm Aid and all of the, the farmers and, and uh, groups that are involved with this event. Um, as we all know, the, the Farm Bill is uh, the largest piece of legislation governing how we eat, and it offers an opportunity to truly transform our food system and uh, with policies and incentives that encourage sustainable, and as we like to say at uh, SRAP, socially responsible uh, agriculture, which can rebuild critically needed topsoil. It can reduce uh, water and air pollution, strengthen rural economies, support human health and food security, and uh, all while providing climate resiliency, which we'll talk about today. With res uh, sustainable and socially responsible agriculture, we do believe that we can all thrive. On the other hand, with con corporate control, controlled agriculture system comes injustice to the environment, to people, to animals, and to the planet, which we've heard a lot about today. Today's consolidated food and agriculture system drives independent family farmers off the land. It abuses food system workers, perpetuates social and racial injustices, pollutes our air and water, 
exacerbates climate change, compromises animal welfare, extracts wealth from rural communities, and damages public health. Uh, in short, it harms every aspect of life. Uh, a wholly transformed, and I say wholly transformed, farm bill could fix all of that. Um, as you all are no doubt aware, we are deeply entrenched in the farm bill year. Every five years, the federal government reviews the food and farm landscape and renews this omnibus bill, which includes spending for nutrition, crop insurance, conservation, commodities, and more. As we speak, Congress is in the midst of writing a new farm bill, one that has the potential to transform our food system and address the many crises that uh, independent farmers face and also that rural communities that we work with face. As you are, uh, I'm sorry, no farm bill in recent history has adequately addressed the far-reaching changes that we need to see to reform our food and farm system. Uh, the time for change in farm policy direction is now. Uh, without it, we stand on the precipice of a worsening climate crisis, the deepening of racial disparities, um, and the perpetuation of a system that serves corporations instead of communities and the uh, commons we all share, like our soil, our water, and our air. We're holding a people's hearing on the farm bill today because as the word hearing suggests, Congress needs to hear the voices of those who will speak for us all today. It's not the first time that we've tried to be heard. In fact, thousands of farmers, advocates, organizers, activists representing farm communities all over the country have been streaming into Washington and district offices to meet with their representatives all year long. Uh, in February, a large coalition of stakeholders, including farmers, farm workers, rural residents, environmentalists, animal welfare advocates, et cetera, uh, headed to Washington, D.C. to advocate for a food system that prioritizes growing healthy and nutritious food for people over commodity crops like corn and soybeans that feed uh, animals in these industrial systems. We spoke with dozens of legislators asking them to shift federal farm subsidies toward the production of fiber-rich foods and non-industrial regeneratively raised livestock and poultry within a system that's fair and equitable from seed to fork. Uh, in March, the Farmers uh, for Climate Action Rally for Resilience also took place in Washington, D.C. Hundreds of farmers not only rallied and marched uh, up Capitol Hill, but they held dozens of meetings with their senators and congressional representatives. And for what? Today, more than six months later, we've received few indications that Congress listened to the voices of those who visited Washington and called for an improved food and agriculture system that serves all, rather than the corporate few. Today, in fact, we have little evidence that Congress will deliver the farm bill that we actually need, a farm bill that we all deserve. Instead, we must confront the possibility that rather than f providing funding for the farm safety net, for pr programs that promote and support farmer-led climate solutions, and for support of underserved farming communities under threat, the new farm bill may even be worse than the current bill on issues of equity, climate, and corporate consolidation. Consequently, we're gathered here today to amplify once again the voices of our best minds at this people's hearing. The idea for this people's hearing originally originated not only from the gathering sense of feeling unheard by those in power, but also as a result of a series of listening sessions where farm aid organizers heard from the folks in the grassroots who were fighting against concentrated animal feeding operations or factory farms in their communities. All the issues we have sought to prioritize in this year's farm bill discussions, corporate consolidation, pervasive discrimination and environmental racism and climate change are central to a just farm bill. Therefore, today's people hear people's hearing will consist of witness testimony from, I believe, around 12 to 15 community advocates, farmers, and experts. Testimony will cover those three general themes, um, confronting corporate power in the farm bill, racial justice in the farm bill, and climate science and environmental justice in the farm bill. We're incredibly fortunate to be able to hear the expert testimony of the ro this roster of witnesses. They will be introduced to you um, as they come up to take the witness stand. Following the testimony of these experts, we will hear from a handful of audience members um, as, as well. These comments will be limited to about three minutes each, if you're able to talk. In order to manage that demand, we uh, want people to fill out forms, and I believe that Hannah, who's waving right over there in the corner, has the forms, so if, you, if you're interested in talking as an uh, audience member, you should go get a form from Hannah, fill it out with what you want to talk about, so then we can, I believe, we'll choose at least five folks if we can have time to, to get everybody in. 
Um, today's testimony will be heard by a jury of three experts who will sit here uh, at the table after all of our witnesses speak. They will be the people's jury who will participate in a roundtable discussion about the day's t uh, testimonies, which I will also moderate. Um, those jury members are Sarah Vogel, who is a long, uh, longtime farmer activist and lawyer, uh, Dr. Ronald Rainey, a professor of agricultural economics and agribusiness at the University of Arkansas, and Sophia Murphy, who I believe is over there somewhere, from the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Uh, the day's witness testimony, as well as the distillation of their work by the jury, will be delivered um, to Gloria Montano Green, uh, Deputy Undersecretary of Farm Production and Conservation Dis uh, Division at the USDA. We're honored to have her and a few of the other USDA staff with us today. So um, finally, we will hear from um, Rania Masri of the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network on the next steps for the Congress for all of us assembled here and for anyone tuning in at home. So that's the plan for the day. We hope it goes well. I expect you all to be in your seats for three hours. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, There's restrooms if you need them. Um, we are a large crowd, so I ask that you keep your cell phones off, if you can keep your side discussions to a minimum, for our witnesses um, to be heard. These are really important viewpoints that we, we are very excited to share with um, the folks who have um, joined us today. So, and for now, I'd like to call our first witness. I actually, oh, there she is. Um, I'm happy to introduce Patty Lavera. She is the policy advisor for the Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment. Hey, everybody. Nice to see everybody. It's a big crowd. Um, so I got to go first. That's something. Um, so I'm Patty Lavera. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I do policy work for a coalition of groups, many of whom are here called Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment. So it's Missouri Rural Crisis Center, Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, Land Stewardship Project, Dakota Rural Action, Institute for Ag and Trade Policy, and Food and Water Watch. I think I got everybody. That takes half my time to name all of our groups. But what we do, everybody, every one of those groups does a lot of stuff. You've seen them for years. But what we do together as CFFE is we try to take on policies that prop up the factory farm system, like we've been hearing about all day, industrial agriculture when you're talking about raising animals, is different. It is different than what family farms do in every regard. And it is a system. It's not an accident. It's not because it's the best way to do it. It's the most efficient. It makes any sense. It is a system that is propped up by years and years and years of choices in farm bills and funding bills and decisions to enforce a law or not enforce a law. So we have to start chipping away at all of those policies to build back a different system that works better for all of us. So one thing that... If you came to this today, you're not going to be surprised to hear this, is that when we go in to try to change those policies and talk about this system, we usually run right in to folks who have a different opinion. And they tend to be very large, <laughs> very well, uh, well-resourced well corporate entities who are doing just fine in this system because they built it, and they built it to work for them. So... When we talk about corporate control, you know, in, in, when I'm in Washington and I'm hanging out, we have to talk about which antitrust law we're doing and which court case, and then the economists show up, and we use big words like consolidation or concentration, but what it boils down to is power, right? That is the operative word, and there's a couple ways that power shows up, and you all have run into these ways in, in what you're doing in the food system number, what your job is. So there's economic power, not a shocker. Wherever you are, if you are trying to sell something you raise and there's not that many buyers competing for it, do they have to give you the price that you need? If you are a worker selling your labor and there's not that many options, do they have to pay you and provide working conditions that if they don't have any competition for how they treat you or how they pay you? If you are a consumer, do they have to give you a good deal and a quality product and do a good job? They don't, and we have seen those steps, those middle steps of our food supply chain just get tighter and tighter and tighter in terms of a tiny number of companies calling all the shots, and we know what that looks like economically. We can't forget about political power. In our system, economic power is political power, and we just have to be honest about that. So when we talk about the farm bill or this policy or that policy, we have to talk about the reason it looks like that is not bad luck. It's not an accident. It's not because they didn't know. It's because the most powerful voices in that room got the policy they needed, and for a long time, those, those voices, the most powerful voices in the room haven't been us. 
And there's a lot of decision-making power that we really have to not forget to talk about when we talk about the food system that we want. The people in this room are innovators. Right? So if you hang out with people that talk about consolidation and antitrust and corporate power in technology or in pharmaceuticals or in healthcare, they talk about innovation and you know, we're squashing innovation. Y'all are innovators and you shouldn't be stuck in a niche of the market. You should be able to get to a much broader market of consumers who want what you do. But because those steps in the middle are so tightly controlled by companies that have a lot of power, they block you from getting what you need from a marketplace. So that's where we are, and that shouldn't be shocking to anybody who made their way here today. And so the good news and the opportunity is that we are finally having this conversation. We're having this conversation because the people in this room and for decades before the networks we all are in have done that hard work of explaining it again and again and again and calling bullshit on a dominant narrative from these big companies that that's the best we can do. And so we need to take that space that we have made and shifting that narrative and we need to rebuild some different rules. So that's where things like a farm bill come in. So we have multiple opportunities that we have not had before in the administration that is running various agencies. We have rules that we need finished about how meat packers conduct themselves in the marketplace. Congress is, as we speak, trying to block those rules. And we need to keep the space for USDA to finish those rules and use them. So they're doing things we've never seen since the 80s to say we have to think differently about mergers. How big can companies get? It's a draft. We gotta finish it. This can be a theme. If you hang out with me, we got a lot of drafts, and we need to get these new approaches across the finish line. And then there's the farm bill. Not five minutes isn't enough to list the many things we should change in the farm bill. But the good news is there are there are proposals, there are bills on the table for the farm bill to talk about how meat packers conduct themselves. What we are, I made a list because I know I won't forget them. How commodity checkoffs conduct themselves that take farmers' money. <laughs> and go do their work for them supposedly, right? To bring back country of origin labeling, the most basic function of a functional market is telling people what they're buying. All of those bills exist. All of those things could happen in this farm bill. It's not gonna fix what's been broken for a long time, but it would move us in the right direction. So just like we heard in our opening speaker, we're not gonna get those things because they're right. We've been right for a long time. We're gonna get those things because we do this work to build a movement and we take it to the people who are, who are making this policy to build a food system that we actually need. Thanks. Thank you, Patty. Next, I wanna call up Tim Gibbons from the Missouri Rural Crisis Center. Hi, y'all. I'm from Missouri. Um, thank you. I, you know, I, I, I'm friends with Patty. I like to surround myself with people that are smarter than me, and Patty is one of those people. Um, I'm Tim Gibbons. I'm with the Missouri. Ro Hi, Hugh. Um, I'm Tim Gibbons. I'm with the Missouri Rural Crisis Center, a statewide farm and rural organization. MRCC started in 1985. We started the same year as Farm Aid, out of the same movement. Farmers organizing to stay on the farm during an extremely challenging time, the 80s farm crisis. In 1993, MRCC started Patchwork Family Farms. You'll see us tomorrow at the concert. It's a program of ours and a project of, uh, to keep independent family farm hog producers on the farm, raising hogs tr the traditional way and getting paid a fair price, and that's very important. We started Patchwork in the early 90s because we and our hog producing members saw the writing on the wall that the hog market was being taken from them, industrialized, corporatized, at the expense of farmers, consumers, our rural communities, our water and air, everything we value. As a result, since the mid-1980s, uh, nearly 90% of Missouri hog producers have been put out of business. Uh, over 80% of U.S. hog producers have experienced the same consequence. To say it was a big deal for factory farm corporations to put hundreds of thousands of U.S. of family farmers out of business doesn't carry enough weight. It was an absolute catastrophe to farm families, to our local economies, to our food system, to our national security. You could just go on and on to w what it damaged. But what makes it even worse is that they did it by controlling our democratic process and using billions of our taxpayer dollars to do it at our expense. The result, 
Now four corporations, multinational corporations, control over 70% of the entire U.S. pork market, and 50% of the U.S. pork market is controlled by two foreign corporations, Chinese-owned Smithfield and Brazilian-owned JBS. JBS is also the biggest beef packer in the world, and they're all, they also own Pilgrim's Pride Poultry, so they have control over multiple proteins. That's why we're here today, and that's why we've continued the fight for the future of independent family farms, rural communities, and a fair, democratically controlled food system. And we are demanding the same things right now to save independent cattle producers that we demanded in the 90s to save independent hog producers. At, and we, we, we're a rural organization in Missouri. We bring vastly different people in the same room, as you can imagine. And we talk about these things, and everybody's shaking their head yes, from Democrat to Republican, from progressive to libertarian. Everybody knows what the problem is. We're not dumb out here. We just are, we need to create the power to fight back. Thank you. For decades, we have been fighting this fight. We have been working to stop a small number of corporate factory farms from replacing hundreds of thousands of local family farms. We have been fighting for strong local economies, good jobs, local innovation, clean water and air, a sustainable climate, and a truly representative democracy. No matter what corporate, uh, the corporate dominant narrative is shoving down our throats continually, their takeover of our farm and food system did not come out of inevitability. It's not because this is the way it should be. And it did not come out of efficiency, but instead it came from calculated policy decisions at the state, federal, and international levels, heavily and unfairly influenced by corporate special interests, their lobbyists, and campaign contributions. This is not what democracy looks like. Instead, and right now, we need to change course, and we need to have policies that reflect our values and our food system and democracy and our health and our sustainability. Um, and we have a good opportunity now, and there are some things that I want to mention that are some wins recently. And Patty sort of stole a little thunder here. Um, but these wins are not just uh, also not inevitable. They're, they're due to our decades of organizing on these issues. Um, we know how we got here, and we know how to get out. Um, for example, President Biden's 2021 executive order on promoting competition in the American economy working to establish some semblance of fairness in industries that impact our lives is a really big deal. USDA is drafting stronger Packers and Stockyards Acts uh, rules, which Patty alluded to, which Congress, uh, the House, is trying to do away with as we speak. Another recent win, the D Department of Justice and FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, recently drafted new rules to address corporate mega mergers to stop the tide towards further monopolization. These are good things, but they would not have come about without organizing and exposing the truth, and also making good policies good politics, and making good politics good policies. That's an important part of our work in narrative development. Right now, we have an important opportunity for a new Farm Bill, a new vision, a Farm Bill that supports families, communities, workers, and consumers, our environment. We need a Farm Bill written for and by people, farmers, consumers, workers, not written for and by corporations. The next Farm Bill must include policies that establish competitive markets and provide a fair price to farmers and a fair wage to workers. It must provide an adequate nutrition safety net for everyone who needs assistance and address historic discrimination in the design of and access to farm programs. The next Farm Bill must prioritize independent family farms and real conservation instead of funneling taxpayer-funded conservation and climate dollars to multinational corporations and their factory farms, essentially rewarding them for the pollution they create. The next farm bill, it, it needs to stop subsidizing factory farms. Factory farms would not be the way they are right now if our government and our taxpayer dollars at corporate request did not do this. The guaranteed loan program created the factory farm system that we have right now. This is a big deal and it's a big undertaking. There's no silver bullet, but we need to get this done and we need to get it done now. Um, now is the time. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate Farm Aid so very much. We love you. I love all y'all. Thank you. Every phone call, every Zoom meeting I'm ever in with Tim, I learn something and he's always that spirited. So <laughs> I appreciate him. What's that? He really does, and we learn from him every time we hear from him. So uh, our next guest is Berlene Wobeater, and I actually know uh, her bio says that she's an Iowa farm girl and a, a member of Iowa CCI. 
Um, but I know her also as a grassroots leader and a, a CAFO fighter, actually, because we've worked with her before. So um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce Berlin. I have nothing but respect for every speaker who has already talked today. And I offer my respect to all the farmers here and to all the ones who are at home keeping the farm going despite all of the obstacles against us. I am Berlene Wolbeater here from Tama County, Iowa, and I'm a proud member of Iowa CCI. My husband, he is at home watching the weather reports and the pasture conditions because we're in our fourth year of drought. My concerns today will center and relate to the cattle and beef industry. I'm not the experienced herdsman. That title belongs to my late father, my late father-in-law, my ever-present husband, who despite being of retirement age, continues with his passion of managing our small cow-calf herd. That's been with us for 43 years and helped the previous generation who started with very meager beginnings, those cattle helped those farms continue. As for my place in this story, you might, you simply don't grow up around cattle production without having a few vivid memories. The times my father placed me in the driveway while he was driving cattle by when I was just tiny and said, now keep those cattle from turning in here. Like, what would I have done if they had tried? And then the bull Rolo mischief walking by and looking at me, terrifying. And then the days of making hay when we had small bales we made our hay that way, and it was hot, hard work, but it was always a reward to get that lunch out in the field. And I will say that I did have a chance to be, for a year, the, proudly the Tama County Beef Queen. <laughs> but those are the sentimental memories that surround the genuine work that we did. But around that is this framework of policies that we've been talking about, policies, laws, regulations, market pressures, which make one action more likely than another, one practice more likely than another, one outcome more likely than another, and one group of people more likely to be advantaged than another. And that is why we are here today. I worked off the farm with really a passive interest in the farm during most of our marriage, but that all changed dramatically when, as SRAP knows, our community was threatened by Iowa Select, Iowa's ag giant. And we got involved in the fight. I didn't want to have to go to bed every night and close my window because it was going to stink and all of the other bad things that go along with it. But we learned very quickly who had the power, who had the regulations, and who had the law on their side. And we would never have succeeded without the help of Iowa CCI and SRAP. And I thank you so much because I can still open my window at night. And I will say that although my husband is the expert in cattle production, he would never stand here and talk to you like this. So he's better off at home. Iowa CCI members are fighting for a farm and food system that's good for family farmers, workers, eaters, and the environment. And we are fighting to put people and planet first. We fight back against big money corporations and the corporate ag industry. The tremendously impactful federal farm bill is up for its five-year renewal, and that's what we're talking about. And we want that federal farm bill to serve the interests of everyday people like Pete and myself, and not the interests of corporations like Smithfield, JBS, Cargill, and ADM. Specifically, the Farm Bill should include mandatory country of origin labeling, or COOL, for beef. I asked my uh, U.S. representative at a recent meeting if she supported the bill, and she didn't know yet because she hadn't read through it, and she represents cattle producers. So we want SF-52 the US, through in the U.S. Senate and HR 5081 in the House um, they're both bipartisan bills to reinstate COOL, which we had in the past but was taken away in 2015. Um, so by reinstating COOL, consumers will know that their beef is coming where it's born, raised, and processed. Uh, meat packers will no longer be able to practice the deception of importing beef, repackaging it, and labeling it as a product of the United States. 
and thereby lowering our <laughs> profits. And finally, consumers can confidently choose U.S. raised beef when they go to the stores. Now, I have more to say, but we are at a time limit, so I will close, and I know that a lot of what I say or would have said will be said by other people, so thank you for listening. Thanks, Berlin. Next, I have Jim Love. Uh, he is a fourth generation farmer and a lifelong resident of Boone County, Indiana. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today. I, uh, as she said, I'm a fourth generation farmer. We farm here north of Indianapolis. I am also uh, one of the members of the Boone County Preservation Group, which is a grassroots organization that is focused on trying to preserve farmland. And so, although there's a lot of issues in agriculture right now on how we do things or why we do things or at what size we do things, but you have to keep in mind that if we don't have land to do any of those things on, none of that discussion matters at all. And so as we lose our, lose our land base, which we do on a daily basis to lots of worthy causes, people like to live in homes, churches need to be built, we need new roads, but there are also a lot of causes that can be repurposed on some other land. And so right now, our community is under siege for about 10,000 acres of virgin farmland that they want to turn over into industrial use. When you think about that, we have lots of land in Indianapolis that could be repurposed, and that's, the, that's not, we're not an organization that says we're going to have absolutely no growth because I know that uh, a lot of folks that have a lot of great causes still want toilet paper to wipe their backside. And so that has to be made somewhere, and we realize that. And so we're not trying to be completely uh, unrealistic, but what we do say is, in the case of some of these facilities, let's build them on places where other industries have failed, or let's rebuild them on blighted ground, or let's pick and choose where we put in solar factories. Because if we're going to build a bunch of solar panels, Let's do it on ground that doesn't raise a good crop. It's very easy, if you'd like to see where those areas are, pull up the USDA's statistics on where the prime farmland is in the United States. And right now, you guys are sitting in it. So no matter where you came from, right now you're sitting in some of the most prime farmland here through the three eyes and into Ohio is some of the best farmland in the United States. It's also some of the land that right now is currently under siege by global elites as well as politicians who feel like they know far better than you do about what this land needs to be purposed for. And so right now, our family farm, which is rather small, but we're happy with it, uh, sits right in the middle of their bullseye of their 10,000 acre uh, uh, facility that they want to build. And the thing that, that, that will probably surprise you is the people that do this oftentimes are very well-meaning because they want to build big campuses with beautiful pastures and beautiful places for people to walk and enjoy nature. But what they discount is the fact that we already have those spots. The only difference is that those spots that we have actually feed everybody on an annual basis as well as do the things that they would like to do with their, their new revisited, uh, agricultural, or revisited nature preserve that they would like to build. Our nature preserve is tended by us at our cost and at the end of the year puts food and fiber back into the system. And so that's all we really ask is this, that we get support for those kind of uh, programs. And we would ask that our state doesn't use our tax dollars to do that because that's the other atrocity that's taking place here in Indiana, as well as many other states around the nation, is states have now decided to become developers. And so in an effort for the race for the microchips or the, the battery factories or any other number of things that uh, they would like to build, the states have decided to become developers to make shovel-ready ground because shovel-ready ground is more advantageous when you're trying to usurp money out of the federal government to build one of these green energy projects. If you have shovel-ready ground, you can get your green energy money, get started, and even if it fails, you can disappear in the night like many of these green projects do with the people who started them being the benefactor and the taxpayers being the loser. So these are the kind of projects that, that we see coming into our neighborhood, and these are kind of some of the projects that we have tried to work against and try to maintain the land. The simple solution for farmers is don't sell your land. But the problem is there are, these groups have huge amounts of attorneys and other people that are professional browbeaters that prey on the elderly 
prey on those who are financially uh, in, in shortfall or prey on families that maybe just can't decide if they still want to be in the farming business. And as we get further and further from family farms because of the fact of, of generations that have disappeared and the next generation says, hey, I don't think I really want to farm. So now four or five brothers and sisters own the farm and they can't all conclude whether they want to keep it in, under their ownership or not. So that's the kind of problems that we have. And we work very hard on a daily basis with our neighbors and our growers to try to convince them, hold on to that farm, grow that farm, let's, let's get in here and let's grow crops and feed a hungry world. Because uh, when I do get a chance to go out and speak to school kids, I always ask them the same question. On the way to school this morning, did you see more new houses and buildings or did you see more new farmland? And a group of fourth graders is even smart enough to think about that for a minute. And they'll say, you know what? There's a lot more houses there in this farmland. And I assure them, because it's not my job to be fear mongering, I tell those fourth graders, I say, you know what? You're absolutely right. And there's more people this year than there were last year. And agriculture has done a fantastic job of maintaining growth and productivity to feed the growing population on fewer acres. But I don't know how much longer we can pull that off. Right now, I fear that we are approaching some of the top ends of what we can do as far as uh, uh, producing more crops and more food and fiber on fewer acres. And so as, as we think about the farm bill, I'd like to see the government get involved and make sure that we don't have government or we don't have foreign entities purchasing this land. And we do not have people purchasing this land to turn it into non-agricultural uses because right now it is very hard to differentiate between some who those folks are. And so a lot of times you're going to see names that are, you're very familiar with that are very much backed by foreign entities. And it's very hard to differentiate that over time. So I appreciate the time to speak with you guys today and, and uh, thank you for your consideration. Thanks, Jim. I didn't think we were talking about toilet paper today, but good job working that in. <laughs> Next, um, Nessa Shiukut, I'm sorry, Shiutekutli from the National Sustainable Agriculture Organ uh, Coalition. And I screwed that name up, but I apologize. Where is Nessa? There she is. Thank you very much. I did not realize I was going next. <laughs> um, um, well, thank you all for um, the invitation to, to be here. Uh, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, NSAC, is an alliance of over 150 grassroots organizations advocating for federal policy reform to advance the sustainability of agriculture, food systems, natural resources, and rural communities in all 50 states. Um, before coming to NSAC, I spent the last seven years organizing farm workers in Florida. And I have seen their farm workers live in the risks of increasing temperatures, putting them at greater risk of suffering a heat stroke and farmers losing crops due to intensive storm damage like Hurricane Ian last year. A recent report by the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Florida estimates $1.03 billion in agricultural losses as a result of Hurricane Ian's impact. We are at a juncture where we have the opportunity to make sure the next farm bill which Congress is writing now, addresses the needs of small farmers and takes steps to create a more sustainable agricultural system with climate action and racial equity as basic components of its structure. The 2023 Farm Bill must include um, most resilient and equitable food and farm system by investing in healthy communities, leveling the playing field for small and mid-sized farmers, building a climate resilient future, and advancing racial equity across the food system. NSAC has been working for 35 years to shift federal policy and programs towards those goals, and our membership has identified hundreds of ways Congress and USDA can help within our 2023 Farm Bill platform and our recommendations for the administration. Today, I want to highlight several specific solutions organized into three categories. First, prioritize farmer-led climate solutions in the 2023 Farm Bill, including the protection of the Inf Inflation Reduction Act, funding by keeping it invested in conservation and in practices that reduce greenhouses, greenhouse emissions. Um, thanks to advocates, the IRA included $20 billion in funding to help farmers adopt climate-friendly practices on farm, but it is at risk of being lost if Congress does not protect this funding in the Farm Bill. It is critical that we protect this funding and its prioritization on climate-friendly <coughs> practices for farmers. Practices like nitrogen management to reduce the risk of nutrient loss to surface water by utilizing precision agricultural technologies and investing in cover crop to reduce soil erosion and promote soil health are examples of farmer-led climate solutions of just such practices. 
Second, invest in diversified farm systems that build farmers' resilience in the face of climate change, perennials, crop rotation, grazing for livestock, biological diversity, and resource conservation. For example, with rainfall more often coming in heavy concentrated event, events, soils have more water holding capacity and faster water infiltration will fare better than lower capacity, less permeable soils lost to overland downpour runoff. Instead, absorptive high capacity soils lose far less soil to erosion and store more moisture to sustain crops through periods of drought, and this can be achieved by adding perennial plants to the ecological system. The addition of agroforestry to an agricultural system can buffer not just variation in precipitation, but also temperature and winds. Greater shade and shelter, carefully planned, can protect against both extreme cold events and extreme heat. Likewise, temporal diversity of crop rotation like that being tried at the Wisconsin Integrated Systems Cropping Trial, developing polyculture with two or more crop species in the same field at the same time can increase water conservation. The third solution we want to lift up today is advanced equity by ensuring farmers of color and other communities who have experienced discrimination have priority access to federal farm programs and resources, including those that can help them build resilience in the face of climate change. We can do this in a number of ways. Increase access to key working lands conservation programs like the Conservation Stewardship Program and Environmental Quality Incentive Program, expanding existing funding set asides for socially disadvantaged and beginning farmers to at least 30 percent, increase technical assistance and resource availability for farmers of color, including expanded hours of availability at USDA service centers and increased language accessibility resources. Establishing the practice of releasing USDA information in multiple languages at once to avoid delays in information sharing for non-English speakers. Committing resources to research that address the unique impacts of climate change on BIPOC farmers, farm workers, and members of low-income communities. Prioritizing investment in underserved and minority-serving institutions that provide research, education, and extension services and strengthen data collection and analysis at USDA to inform racial equity-driven decision-making, including on climate-focused programs and policies. Finally, we would like to close by adding that there is already a demonstrated support for those proposals. This moment demands urgent action to ensure that our collective future. No one understands this better than, farming communities than the farming community, which is at the front line of the climate crisis. Um, over 500 farmers from at least 40 states and two U.S. territories came to Washington, D.C. last March to demand action on climate in the Farm Bill at the Farmers for Climate Action Rally for Resilience. This week, farmers and advocates are mobilizing against as part of Farmers for Climate Action Week, sharing stories of impact, action, and hope. Congress has the power to act now, and we call on them to prioritize real transformative action for climate justice throughout market bills that focus on climate justice and prioritizing support for small and underserved producers. These bills include the ARA, Increasing Land Access and Security and Opportunity Act, and the Small Farm Conservation Act. So look for us tomorrow uh, <laughs> in, uh, at our booth um, during the concert. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, he said the biggest struggle he has is that milk prices only go to the middlemen. And I think that's a familiar story for many of you in the room. And that's a, a big thing to him that's been long known to save family farming. The USDA has known about this problem for a long time and it remains intractable. Farmers like him don't want to be climate problems. They're just exhausted and they have so few resources which often go to large operators. At the same time that agricultural operations are getting fewer, they're also getting whiter. In Indiana, according to USDA, there are just 134 farmers who identify as black, compared to 93,700 that identify as white. That's a 700 to one ratio. 93% of US ag land is owned by white operators. The Farm Bill can and must address this inequality in every possible way. We should be, exp <laughs> we should be expanding the conversation um, con conservation elements, sorry, of the Farm Bill and not threatening them. The IRA added $20 billion of supplemental money to four Farm Bill conservation programs for practices that sequester carbon. But programs like these need to be used to truly be accountable to the carbon math and prioritize equity and more sustainable crops. In Indiana, we see the popularity of emerging carbon markets as a tool for farmers to advance their growing techniques, but struggling small and minority-owned farms are often left out of these benefits, which take time and resources to seek out, expertise to understand, and can discriminate against farmers of color. I've asked some of these investment managers how they plan to make sure farmers of color can participate in these initiatives, and no one has an answer for me. USDA should specifically set out to use the tremendous potential of carbon markets to directly benefit minority farmers through its own programs or a partnership with one of many national credit issuers. At ECI, one of our signature programs is the Thriving Schools Initiative, proudly a USDA-funded program that helps schools initiate student-led sustainability projects, often a school garden. Students who often have had no hands-on experience growing food can learn a valuable cross-section of skills and ideas while producing food of their own um, in their schoolyards for the cafeteria. We hope that the future Farm Bill can take our tiny gem of a program and scatter its seeds to communities across America, especially those in underserved areas with little or no access to fresh food and farming education. Agriculture sits at a critical apex of climate responsibility and climate vulnerability. It's now producing 10% of US carbon emissions, 40 to 50% of methane, 60 to 80% of nitrous oxide emissions, primarily from intensive feedlots, and manure, fertilizer applications, and management methods. Yet every aspect of food production is being harmed by climate impacts. $19 uh, billion in insurance payments in 2022 alone for disasters. And agricultural land also occupies 44% of the US. This also places them in the necessary position to maintain regenerative carbon sequestration and myriad climate adaptation measures. And I wanna make special note that I did say regenerative sequestration because the Midwest is about to be ground zero for carbon injection, which farmers should stand with us to oppose as a false climate solution designed to aid big fossil fuels and dirty industries to live another day and not help our communities. This farm bill should not only expand on existing programs like the Conservation Reserve Program, which pays farmers to remove environmentally sensitive land from production and plant native grasses and other plants that benefit wildlife, it should augment our efforts to conserve existing wetlands, existing forest stands as an important source of flood prevention, um, water quality management, and carbon sequestration. The program should structure its benefits to avoid small farmers ignoring the program because they think that their just few acres aren't worth applying. In Indiana, this program has protected over one million acres of land. Sorry. I'll hurry up, sorry. There are more opportunities in the Farm Bill to tie environmental protection to agricultural support, whether that be insurance, credit, rural development, commodity support. Every single program should now come with obligations to do something to fight climate and assistance to carry that out. For too long, we have been told that the ends of providing affordable food to Hoosiers has justified harmful agricultural means. Our state legislature has completely abdicated its responsibility to levy protections against the most dangerous runoffs from agriculture and um, emissions from farming. At the Indiana State House, only some agricultural operations have their voices heard. If the USDA does not speak for all of us, Indiana is unlikely to stand up for environmental and public health and ag, and I'm tired of being told we can't do both. Provide great food for all and defend our environment and future. Our most critical dual missions to build a livable future and feed America should be recursively reflected in each other because the alternative is unimaginable.
All right. Um, next, we have Ewan Corral from Dakota Rural Action. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Yoan Corral, and I am honored to call the homeland of the Ocheti people, that's the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota peoples, my home today. Um, I work with an organization, Dakota Rural Action, that began organizing in 1985. And we secured our 501c3 in 1987, making us a younger child of the Campaign for the Family Farmers in the Environment family. Um, I will be brief today as my colleagues <coughs> who have gone before me have passionately um, laid down the facts for us today. I think together we all know about how our current food and farm policies are failing us all. Here are a few highlights that we demand um, we make of the farm bill. We envision a farm bill that establishes, promotes, and supports policies to create an equitable food and agricultural system free from corporate influence and continued systemic injustice. A farm bill that supports infrastructure that centers community-based food systems over putting more money and power into the hands of corporate elite. A farm bill that fosters diversity and we're talking about all manner of diversity. That includes diverse peoples, communities, cultural diversity, and biodiversity. A farm bill that, separate, that celebrates differences and uplifts black and indigenous and people of color foodways and doesn't continue to separate us. A farm bill that aims to be part of the solution building pathways of land access for those disenfranchised by historical U.S. policies of land taking and enslaved labor. A farm bill that protects natural resources and isn't creating false climate solutions like that were just described, such as defining CO2 as a commodity and incentivizing unchecked CAFO development and biodigester build out in rural communities. Powers, <laughs> powers that be are very excited about these expensive false climate and food production solutions creating an environment where public resources are being diverted from healthy food and farming systems that harness the natural abilities of people and the planet to help heal our climate crisis. Thank you. Okay, we've heard from uh, Justin Soleil already once today, and I'm going to invite him back up to talk to us again. Um, he is a member or a citizen of the uh, Uni United Homa Nation and also a commercial fisherman. Halito, bonjour. I want to start off with a quote from Benjamin Franklin. It says, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as we are and those who are affected. My favorite principle in the Jimenez Principles is commitment to self-transformation. As we change societies, we must change from operating on the mode of individualism to community-centeredness. We must walk our talk. We must be the values that we say we're struggling for, and we must be justice, be peace, and be community. The Farm Bill, <coughs> what is happening now nationally and statewide? This reauthorization is moving really slowly for a bunch of reasons. It expires on September 30th. We expect to have a draft in October, maybe November. At the state level in Louisiana, we have been talking with legislators to get the priorities of a small-scale, mid-sized Louisiana farmers into the Farm Bill, as well as building a farmer network and keeping them updated on Farm Bill happenings and actions to take. For now, we're pushing for marker bills, bills that are meant to be added to the much larger Farm Bill. What can you do and what can your orgs do? 
I have a few acts here. The Agriculture Resilient Act. This is the climate marker bill that needs to be in this farm bill. There's Justice for Black Farmers Act. Similar to above, this is the racial justice bill. It corrects historical discrimination by the USDA against black farmers in particular, and also includes programs and policies to infuse racial equity broadly into the food system. Black farmers have been targeted for exploitation and dispossession by the USDA since its inception. This bill chips away at those harms, prevents more harm from being done to today's black farmers, and specifically works to create a new future for black farmers to thrive in. Farmer to Farmer Education Act, Farmland for Farmers Act, which is a huge barrier to widespread, sustainable, small and mid-sized agriculture in the U.S. and is, um, in the U.S. is lack of access to affordable farmland. This is exacerbated by corporations buying up huge swaths of farmland, a.k.a. land grabbing. Bill works to prevent corporations from buying farmland. Increasing Land Access, Security and Opportunities Act, Seeds and Breeds for Future Act, and Agrivolvoltex, agri agri I'll figure it out, <laughs> Research and Demonstration Act of 2023. What we do at our coalition is we fight for the people and we also fight against carbon capture and sequestration, which has been numerously said today. Um, <laughs> Louisiana has become a sacrifice zone for industry and CCS. Just in my community, um, a letter of intent was signed with a company from Houston to do carbon capture sequestration seismic testing on 46,000 acres of wetlands. Those wetlands are used by seafood as breeding grounds. Those are where our fish and our shrimp come in to breed and grow and should be protected at all costs. Our waters are being contaminated by pipelines that leak. According to that powers that be, there are 3,000 oil leaks recordable in the Gulf. I worked in the oil and gas industry for 10 years. I've seen 3,000 leaks in a day. Um, biggest proponent in the farm bill also when it comes to my community is why does it matter to climate justice work? Agriculture is a massive emitter and is heavily reliant on petrochemicals for fertilizers and pesticides. What happens is when the runoff goes into the Mississippi, it comes and it knocks on my door. And it's the largest reason for hypoxia in the Gulf. And it kills our fish, it kills our shrimp, and it kills a way of life for my people in the South. So if we can go to renewable sources of pesticides, go for, get away from these petrochemicals. You're not just saving yourself, your land, but you're also saving people where I live. We're all connected by what is our mother, the Mississippi River. Thank you. We're covering a lot. You all are awesome. You're hanging in. Um, we have covered uh, corporate power. We've also talked about climate, climate science. And our last um, section is going to be on racial justice. So I invite uh, Rosa Safreda. Um, from uh, Compañeros Campesinos. Hi, uh, I'm Rosa Saavedra from Compañeras Campesinas. We're a member of the Rural Coalition. And um, I want to I wanna say a couple of things. And uh, um, so I want three words to kind of be the basis. And that is to, you know, prioritize, lift up, and invest. And I'm going to just focus on three kind of areas. And then I want to tell you a story sort of about the impact of not having 
racial justice, not having equity. And I hope there'll be people in here who can listen to this. Um, I know all of us are here, but um, I just hope that we can. Anyways, I'll tell the story. So <laughs> the three things I think are important for the Farm Bill is to prioritize, uplift, and invest is in regenerative, regenerative and local food systems, which a lot of folks already here talked about, right? It's really important because in our communities where there is lack of justice, lack of equity, we're already, you know, we're working on this, but it's not being prioritized in the government sense, and it's not being uplifted, that's for sure, and, uh, and there is not very much investment going on either. So th the second thing is um, nurturing um, new and diverse and small scale farmers. It's important because agriculture, I mean, we can't just grow stuff. We have to grow agriculture as well. I mean, economically it's wise because like I, I came uh, from North Carolina by way of Puerto Rico <laughs> And, um, and agriculture in North Carolina is the number one industry still, so we gotta keep growing. Um, and the third one is um, the doing some, I mean, prioritizing, uplifting, and investing in serious, if we really wanna see reversing discrimination, the historic discrimination that's going on, there has to be some real investment in that, real investment. So the story I want to tell is I worked on the um, Pigford II, Hispanic and Women Claims, and now I'm working on the 22007, which is also a discriminations process. And, and in, in each one of those, the same thing has come up. And it's really brought to me as a person working with farmers, um, it's really brought it to a real human level and we can't forget, I mean, these are not just policies, these are not just things, laws, whatever, what's behind that? Just like farmers are not just growing stuff, right? It's feeding people. There's the humanity side to it. And in each one of those, I've seen and experienced and shared and, and shared with the person telling me their story, that pain, right? And it's, this is not an emotional appeal. This is a reality check about what happens when our laws, when our policies are not equitable and lack justice, right? Um, they make people invisible, they break people's lives, and in each one of those cases I've had people tell me and then break down into tears. So recently in, in Puerto Rico, I had a farmer, maybe 50-something years old, 56 years old, I think, and his, his knees are bad now, but 15 years ago, when he applied for a loan and was told, no, you can't have that because of some bullshit reason, uh, he, I'm sorry, he, he broke down into tears and then apologized to me for breaking down into tears. And, um, and I realized what that meant to his life how can you get that back? You know, you can't get that back, right? You have to stop that from happening. The process of making people invisible happens through laws. Um, so these are the things that the Farm Bill cannot do, cannot be complicit in making people invisible so that then you can eradicate them. Thank you. All right, next up we have uh, DeAnthony Jamerson from Legacy Taste of the Garden. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I wanna say that I'm actually here um, out of respect and to pay homage to uh, the legacy farmers that came before me um, and also as an advocate for the next generations. Uh, one of the things that I would like to highlight in this farm bill is access. 
Um, I read something uh, the other day uh, about the 2018 Farm Bill, and it stated that 85% of the funding went to the nutrition, the nutrition title in the Farm Bill. Uh, the nutrition title funds all your nutritional programs like SNAP, WIC, et cetera. Um, I think it's important to, have, to allow farmers to have access, easier access to accepting these programs. Uh, I've heard <laughs> there's been too many stories or too many times that I've heard um, either a farmer or even a customer not being able to use these services at farmers markets. So I believe that it is very important to add to the farm bill because on the farmer side, some of these applications are a little too complicated to fill out and the process of getting accepted is, you know, a, a, tr a, a long process. So. Even for myself, by the end of the summer is when I got it, got my machine. So it's like I missed out on the whole summer of offering these services. So I think that's one of the things that is important. Um, I also think improving conservation practices uh, to help. I mean, I'm sorry, to help conservation programs to help farmers to transition into these practices is very important. Um, I believe that some of these conservation practices. Um, are used by small uh, urban or BIPOC farmers. So recognizing or improving these programs will allow these farmers or growers to be able to get their product to market, if that makes sense. Um, also, I would like to see access for new and beginning farmers, um, allowing them to have access to obtaining land. Um, um, I talked to one of the guys, the National Youth Farmers Coalition supporting programs to help farmers, young farmers, be able to get land to be able to start farms, I believe is very important. Um, I also would like to promote a farm bill that recognizes the rights for BIPOC farmers and to help pro to have programs to help sustain those farmers as well. Um, and I would just like to say, Farm Aid, thank you for allowing me to get my voice out there. We have a couple more. Uh, Brandon Smith from the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Smith. I'm a fourth generation black farmer. I'm a member of the, sub, of the Federation of Southern Cooperative Land Assistance Fund. The Federation of Southern Cooperative Land Assistance Fund is a 56-year-old cooper, cooperative association of black farmers, landowners, who are seeking racial equity in this year's Farm Bill. The Federation supports increasing the FSA microloan which is now currently $50,000. We would like to increase it to $100,000. Uh, they would also support increasing the farm operation loan from $400,000 to $600,000. Um, we are, we support dedicating 13% of all conservation program fundings, such as EQIP, to black farmers, ranchers, and landowners. Uh, let me hit something else. Let's hit another one. We support targeted conservation program funding incentives to achieve loan forgiveness within the heirs' property relending program. We support a farm and student loan forgiveness program for black farmers and professionals working at community-based organizations serving black farmers, ranchers, and landowners. Without a more racially just farm bill, that delivers equity, we will see black farmers eradicated from agriculture. Thank you. Uh, do we have Savi Horn from Land Loss Prevention Project? Hey, 
Hey, Brendan. Brendan, I love that walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and just so you all know, the Federation is in the Lone Star State, so he got that honestly in Texas. Uh, <laughs> not just Mississippi. Um, it really is a beautiful mosaic, just looking out on everyone and just knowing that we all come together with a commonality of purpose. How do we make a farm bill more responsive to farmers' needs, first and foremost, the communities that they live in, and health for the planet? But what's missing when we deal with the farm bill is that we need to also ground the reality that this U.S. farm bill goes global and impact every family farm everywhere in the world. And so when we negotiate, we have to look at what is that for the rest of us. Uh, there was a, an African economist from one of the West Coast countries, I think his name was, he might be from Egypt, Samira Men, and it was the, w the West and the rest. Right? So when we ground ourselves in th that reality, then we understand why we must come together and work <coughs> purposefully on the farm bill. The fact that our opposition at times seems greater than us, right? We had an instance where an act of Congress made it so that debt relief from the emergency uh, relief program for BIPOC farmers would have recognized the fact that 90-something percent of the resources during the COVID period went to large white farmers. <coughs> and in fairness, Congress Department of Agriculture wanted to rebalance that. But the forces of opposition, they were so quick in their organizing with, with lawyers of their persuasion that, that and the courts that it got squashed. So now we have this renewed opportunity under the Inflation Reduction Act and that is 22007. I want to give a big shout out to Farmers Legal Action Team for syndicate <laughs> Stephen Carpenter for the superhuman work that they have been doing to help write these manuals weekly, twice a week, sitting on phone calls to help NGOs and community-based organizations understand what's in double 2207, how it can help, how do we prepare the farmers to deal with the 40-page application process. And I want to give a special shout out. Oh, uh, am I allowed to say it? Glory, <laughs> where are you? Oh, you all going to talk about it? Okay, so I have one minute. But the one minute is a very pregnant minute, right? Because <laughs> in the space, we are all pregnant with knowledge and ability. So let's give birth to a farm process that is inclusive, that holds our pain, but at the same time is a collective release for rebirth. We are sitting, as I mentioned before, in the age of the Anthropocene. We have uh, heard of all these other ages, right, of, of on the planet, but this one challenges the very existence of the planet. We must all come together to make sure climate justice is embedded and is actively moving in the farm bill for all of us 
and the rest of the world. Let's do it. That was a great way to end things. So thank you. Um, that was actually all of our uh, our witness testimony from our farmers and, and organizers and advocates. Um, I've been told from Hannah, and I'm looking for her right now. Um, there you are. So we are not going to do the audience testimony. We're going to go ahead. Are we going to take a break? Still? Okay. It looks like we have um, some issues with time. So instead of um, having some of the audience uh, come up here and do their testimony, we are actually going to move those um, forms that you all filled out. Apologies for not being able to get up and speak, but we're going to move those forms uh, directly to uh, the USDA staff to make sure that they do get those messages from you all. Um, but we're going to have to go ahead and I, I believe take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll speak with our jurors and then we'll go ahead and present all of this information um, synthesized together to our USDA staff. So if you can take a 10 minute break and come back and join us, I would love it.
If y'all can start making your way back to your seats, we're going to bring this to a conclusion, finish the rest of our program. Can we get y'all to come back to your seats, please? If we can have your attention, we're going to get started now, y'all. Just come on in and have a seat. If you don't mind, that sounded very demanding. I didn't, I didn't mean it that way. I promise I was raised right. I can make demands. I know, I know. It's the Shirley in me. If you come in and take your seat, please, we're going to get started. Thank you so much.
Hello? Okay, it is working. Are we all ready? Can you hear me okay? Excellent. I'm sitting on a stage with people smarter than me. I like it. Um, so now that we've heard all of our expert testimony, um, we're, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to moderate a discussion among our three expert jurors. Um, the first being Sarah Vogel, who uh, many of uh, you are familiar with as the farmer's lawyer. In her memoir of the same name, she tells the story of taking the United States government to court in the Coleman versus Block case, which she won <laughs> on behalf of... She won it on behalf of 240,000 farmers facing foreclosure during the 1980s farm crisis. She served two terms as the North Dakota Secretary of Agriculture and is a longtime friend of Farm Aid and of many of you here. So welcome, Sarah. Um, I have uh, Dr. Ron Rainey at the end, and he is a professor of agricultural economics and agribusiness and is an assistant vice president at the University of Arkansas. Uh, Professor Rainey's work has focused on enhancing farm and ranch value-added entrepreneurship, risk management, and marketing. He also seeks to increase collaboration among local organizations to further access technical ex assistance in socially disadvantaged communities, and he is a member of the USDA's Equity Commission. So welcome. Thanks for joining us. And last, I have Sophia Murphy. She's the executive director at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Sophia is a food systems and international uh, economy expert with 30 years of professional experience, including as a board chair, program director, policy analysis, and uh, published writer, a, a policy expert and advocate who is focused on resilient food systems, agriculture, and international trade. Sophia has worked primarily with civil society organizations as well as with government, intergovernmental organizations, and universities. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> so we're going to ask some questions here and have a little discussion, and then uh, after this discussion, we will present some of the information that we've provided or been uh, offered today to... Uh, our USDA staff. So um, as you all listen to the witness testimony uh, today, what were your main takeaways? Thank you. You can take it. It reminded me of the 80s <laughs> when groups like you, many, this reminded me so much of the 80s when groups like the the people in this room, and there are many more now, but there was many of the same issues were happening. And I just have one little story I want to share that I thought of this morning as we were listening, or this afternoon, whatever. Um, and that is that oftentimes it seemed as though all the advocacy that was going on by the grassroots groups around the country was not having an impact. And it seemed as though we were you know, <clears throat> shouting in the wilderness and no one was listening to us and we weren't getting anywhere. And then I've just got one little vignette from when I was doing research on my book. I, I bought Ronald Reagan's diary. Um, I didn't know he c could write, but um, <laughs> he did have a diary. And it was sort of day by day, you know, what he did, who he met with, and the movies he watched. He watched a lot of movies, and by the way, he hated the movie Country. He, he hated the movie Country. But um, in, that, in that diary, I was so surprised to see it popping up again and again that Governor Terry Branstead of Iowa was in his office pounding on his head because of what was happening to farmers in Iowa. So I think Dave Ostendorf and the people at Prairie Fire Rural Action, they did have an impact. You do have an impact. It may not seem that we have an impact, but we do. And so I just wanted to mention that that was a reflection that it does matter. It does matter when you confront the politicians and write the letters and cumulatively it does matter and it leads to results. So thank you all. I'm in just in awe of all of the work that all of the groups in this room and all the people in this room do. Thank you. Of course, I'm in awe too. Um, 
I, pulling out, I would say one thing is, which is clear, the Farm Bill is shooting agriculture in the foot. You know, it's just undermining the things that we're trying to do. I also sense the determination and see the change happening. And if you were able to hear this morning, I mean, it's an extraordinary, this is just change happening all over. And I do think it has an impact. And I do see, so having worked on consolidation for far too long, there are signs of change in the federal policy. And, and I think that change is coming from here. It's coming from environmental activists. It's coming from women's organizations. It's coming from immigrant right organizations. It's, it's coming from the reality that you know, climate change isn't waiting for a bipartisan consensus on anything. Um, so I also think there's hope that the Farm Bill doesn't have to do it all. And the Farm Bill will either change or change will be forced upon it. Um, and I think we've seen some signs of that and heard about that. And then the last thing that I would say just now is um, that sentence or that protecting our potential and our choices. So that rests in the diversity, um, it rests in trust. When you send me the 40 page application for something, you don't trust what I'm doing. And I maybe won't trust you in return. And so I just was thinking about that word today and thinking about how that happens. And, and one of the realities is USDA doesn't have enough staff. It doesn't have people who know their community because there aren't enough people even in the community. <laughs> and so, so those are realities as well. How do we build the public service to work with us um, the, the, the I said the last thing, but I do want one more. That, that notion of not just community agriculture, but cooperative. Because if we cooperate, we can cooperate large. We don't have to do it only where we see and know each other, but we can build trust beyond that by cooperating. And I thought that was a really helpful thought from this morning's discussion. First off, I just want to say how appreciative I am of be a part of this mosaic and this wonderful diverse perspectives. What, what is alarming is, is the connecting, the similarities from different perspectives, whether we're talking about climate change, corporate uh, uh, influence, or racial equity. What I heard from the overwhelming testimony was uh, the balance of power in the development of our farm bill is, is out of sync. And it's almost out of touch with what it was its origins, which was to drive and support agriculture, food and agriculture. Um, if you go back to 1970, early 70s, I think it was Secretary Earl Butts, I think he's from Indiana. He said, get big or get out. Mm -hmm. Many people call him the father of corporate farming. But get big or get out. What is a problem when our Farm Bill institutes policies it creates a system that says get big or get out. And if there's systemic racism or systemic discrimination to marginalized communities or marginalized people or small farms, it says get out. I forget who said it, but it said that laws make people invisible. No wonder we have black farmers disappearing. No wonder we have small farmers disappearing. And until we can really address that system of our farm bill, that, that trend is going to continue. And as an economist, I can sit up here and I can hear some of the arguments for the gains in efficiency. And I will say that in addition to the testimony, what I see is, is a pursuit of, in many ways, corporate profits at the expense of our rural communities, at the expense of our family farms. And we really have to balance that out because if 7% if of, of, of the profits in ag went to, 7% uh, of the farms got profit, where it had the majority of the profitability. I think if you look at the margins, over half of the farms operated with either minimal or negative profits, and that's just not a sustainable model. So if we look at how the systems are pushing this either very, very large farms or very, very small farms that are relying on off-farm income to even survive, to even live out their passions of being farmers or to pass that on to their kids. We really have to look at it, and it's going to be the voices of this room and the, and the people that you are connected with to stand up to those corporate interests that are heavily influenced in where our policies are being driven, the level of subsidies. So I the people that are invisible, uh, we talk about them, many are in this room. Who is it more visible for? Large-scale corporate farms. Some of the, the um, 
investors and investment groups that are investing and bidding up farmland prices that make it really hard for you to expand or even to survive or stay in business. Even foreign foreigners and foreign multinational companies that are invested in our food systems. And we really need to take a hard look at that. As a country, we need to really take a hard look at that and see where our rural communities are over the last 50 years since that mantra came out, get big or get out. Because those entrepreneurs, those farmers, those entrepreneurs in those rural communities are the backbones of those rural communities. <laughs> and we really need a, a more sustainable system. I need to stop talking, but, but that's it. Because the other deal is, is COVID showed us when those large scale systems, those supposedly efficient systems failed, it was those small family farms that really served. Heard this morning farmers are providers and farmers provided tremendously throughout COVID with these local regional food systems that were resilient and sustainable. And we should strategically look at how do we grow those out. You don't need to stop talking, but as an Indiana resident, you need to stop reminding me that Earl Butts came from here. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, I do appreciate being reminded that change does not happen without us, okay? Uh, the status quo will remain the same unless we voice our opinions and our stories and, and tell them to the people who matter, and, or the people, who, I shouldn't say who matter, but who can make the decisions um, where we need them to. So um, did anything that you heard surprise you today? Okay. Um, lower the heat up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. But I want to make a shout out for lawyers. Oh, is it? My mic is off. Um, I said that I was a little bit surprised at the, um, well, not surprised, but lawyers took a little bit of a hit this morning as people were talking about um, the corporate. Corporate, corporate agriculture is lawyered up. And, and I'm afraid that we need to also lawyer up some more. Steve Carpenter here for Farmers Legal Action Group is, uh, <laughs> stand up and take a bow. <laughs> he, he's too well known already. Um, but. It, it really is important because over the years I've noticed that there's so much attention paid to the farm bill. All these farm groups concentrate on getting the farm bill out when it's, when it's written, but then it comes to getting the regulations out. And many times, uh, like the Reagan administration was expert at like just avoiding following the law. And, and, and this went on and on. So you had to be able to go to court and uh, and I think that that's something that we also need to be paying attention to. So some of, there are probably a panoply of s solutions that could shift attorney's fees, for example, when you sue the federal government and you have to pay. Equal credit opportunity is one. But look at all the discrimination that has happened in the other aspects of the farm program, the inability to access the NRCS programs or the, um, environmental support and so on, that happens too. But the Equal Credit Opportunity Act had a, had a provision that said you could sue the federal government and you could get legal fees. So you had the Pigford case, you had the Hispanic cases, the Love case, the uh, Coleman, um, Coleman versus Block case, the Keeps Eagle case, and that's because there was a, a law that allowed people to sue the government and win. If they win, they could get attorney's fees, so you could get attorney's fees. That's just something to think about uh, when the farm bill is going on, because it, the implementation is uh, sometimes uh, fraught with challenges, and then having that aspect of going to the uh, courts to get things fixed should always be in the back of the mind as people are writing regulations and implementing programs passed by Congress. Thank you. I just want to um, shout out Savvy for bringing in the rest of the world into this. So not that I'm surprised that's part of our mission at ITP and has been since almost as long as Farm Aid has been here, but 
it is very true that around the world, a lot of people are watching this farm bill and uh, they're paying a lot of attention to what's going forward. They're watching nutrition programs as well as farm programs, what we grow, what's insured, how we're dealing with climate, what we're doing on deforestation. So um, just, just to say that that is important, and you have allies all over the world. The Farm Bill is not loved. You don't love the Farm Bill either. You want to grow food for your communities and relocalize food systems. That's what a lot of farmers in a lot of places around the world want to do. Um, NFFC will know this well as well anyway. So I just wanted to lift that up because there's both, um, you know, it's big and powerful and it's beyond these borders, but it also brings solidarity and inspiration and example from beyond the borders as well. Thank you. The one thing that surprised me was, uh, uh, and I was aware of it, but th but uh, it just alerted me was the competition for ag land, the disappearance of ag land, urbanization, because I know even across, I'm from Arkansas, and, and I've seen a lot of solar panels come in, and those solar panels are coming into good flat ag fields, and I know in my mind I was like, why don't they put that on a hillside? The sun's going to shine the same. But uh, but whatever the pressure to take good productive ag land out of production is, is to me is something we need to really consider and think about. If you were to uh, talk to some of the Senate and House uh, Ag Committee folks, what are some of the main takeaways or main points from what you've heard today that you would take to them? I think Sophia wants to go. I'm, I'm <laughs> you can arm wrestle about it if you want. Yeah, we need the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would just say, um, th think about who you're talking to. Wh what is, who is agriculture for you? Who do you think your constituency is? Because I think, I mean, that's the, the one of the fights IETP is fighting with, with our allies at the state level as well. You know, if you're, if you, we're trying to reshape what what the legislature thinks of when they think about agriculture, whether, you know, who is farming, whether that's coming from urban or rural, or actually something maybe a little bit more in between now. Where, where are they sourcing food? What do their kids want to eat? Who are the children of Minnesota? Um, that has all changed, and, and, and I think legislators have ideas in their mind, and if they're not out and about and listening, they don't see it, and we're trying to bring that in front of them. So that's, that's more just about you know, it's not just big ag and, and a food shelf. There's, there's so much happening. Um, and so bringing them out onto the farms as well, as much as we can, I think is the best way to see it. Absolutely, reminding them of who, who their constituents are and what they want. And I'd, I'd, I'd remind them of the importance of ag and food policy, not just in, in food production, but in rural and economic development. Oh, yeah. Uh, because if we are attacking the family farm, we're attacking our rural communities. Mm -hmm. And I would also, I wouldn't challenge, but I would just ask them, what does the farm bill represent? What's the accomplishment of the farm bill? What does it mean to him or her? Mm -hmm. Because if you look across the whole food value chain, the farm <laughs> bill touches every person in every household. Yeah. And I'm not sure if th the policies are looked at with that level of intentionality because when you don't put that intentionality in there, the people that aren't thought about or the people that are told maybe you don't belong or this issue doesn't belong, then they become invisible within that farm bill, whether it's some environmental issues or whether it's worker protections or whether that's um, our marginalized communities and our marginalized farmers. So that's what I would ask. We need to take them on tours of rural communities all over the country Ma so they can see what's actually going on. Make that connection and also tell them some success stories yeah. of what you wanted, what you would hope that it could look like. And there's some success stories there that aren't the traditional model, but show them that there's multiple ways to accomplish it so that when that lobbyist is in there talking about how great this idea or this issue is, just make them aware of uh, that there's other options and there's impacts because oftentimes my perspective, it's the almighty dollar that gets the vote. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's going to be costs to be paid, but they'll be, get, they'll be paid later because those costs aren't considered, whether that's a neglected community, a ne neglected group or sector mm -hmm. of farmers, or even, even the, the way we, uh, our, pro our food is produced. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Anything you'd like to take to the House and Senate Agriculture Committee? Well, I'd like to see their campaign donation lists. Um, <laughs> I want to I see who owns them, you know, and I'm not sure we can do that this that easily, but I think there are ways of figuring out who is, who is, who is, who is paying for them to vote against their own citizens. And call them out on it. Vote them out. Yes, yeah, someone said vote them out. Okay, I think we have about five minutes left. Okay, terrific. Okay, um, I'm going to ask uh, the last question then. What can we do to get the farm bill we deserve? I, I think there, there's, there's power in numbers, and so one, even an individual voice matters, but once that becomes a collective voice, it matters more. And so I encourage every, the mosaic that's here that we connect that mosaic. Because I forget, it was an eloquent uh, quote that they said that, 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 that people didn't care until they came for them. We, we need to let people know that eventually they're going to be coming for you. And I love the Isaiah scripture. It's, it's going to be just a few people living alone or living miserable existence because of what exists as a result. And I, I, I would hope that that's something that, that we can collectively think and inspire us as a call to action. Uh, that we can engage and, and look across and recognize that, that we all have a shared struggle. Um, there may be a completely different need in this room, but there's a shared struggle that can help you achieve that. And we all gain from that. Thank you. I, I really echo it. I just, you know, listening to um, fossil fuel campaigning and, and you know, what, what's happening. And it's wonderful to have so many fisheries people here because those systems are connected in ways that could divide us, but instead we're using it to, to bring people together. But also across that, there's a lot of climate policy that's a real threat to the food systems we want. There's a lot of money there with people who aren't interested in sustainable food systems. So how do we work with the communities who've been fighting the fossil fuel companies to make sure they don't come in and take over the worst aspects of agriculture? The companies are speaking and we have to be. So it's really about broadening, I think, this idea that the the farm bill is one piece for a food system for everyone, and, and there's a big, there's a lot of room to see yourself there if we, if we make that space available. Um, again, hearkening back to the 80s, the first farmers that were threatened by the 80s egg crisis were the black and indigenous, uh, Hispanic farmers, and so on. And then, then it was the small white farmers, and then it was the medium-sized white farmers, and then political power finally came when it was the big white farmers that were threatened. But you know, if if it can be addressed at the at the small farmer, small struggling rural farmer level, then that is in everybody's best interest. You know, the all all farmers benefit when the small farmers, and not only that, there is a crisis also in terms of the aging out of farmers. I think in North Dakota, the average age of farmers is probably 60 plus, <coughs> and most of them um, don't have a, a son or daughter or a neighbor that is going to set up a separate farm it's going to be an add-on to a great big farm. So it's, it's, there's so much at stake now, so much at stake, and um, I, I don't want to see the 80s return. We're going to wrap up this conversation. I really appreciate all three of you um, weighing in on, on uh, the testimony that was given today and, and your insights, and I hope that um, we can continue to have this conversation as the weekend unfurls. Yeah? Uh, another one would be raise, more, raise less corn and more hell. Heck yeah. <laughs> mm. 
Absolutely. So um, we are again fortunate uh, to be joined by a member of the Biden administration, uh, the Deputy Undersecretary of USDA's Farm Production and Conservation Division, uh, Gloria Montano Green. In her capacity at USDA, Deputy Undersecretary Montano Green leads agencies that deliver farm programs and services to farmers, ranchers, and agricultural producers. She's the former state executive director for the Farm Service Agency in her home state of Arizona. Today, she came as a representative of USDA to hear the expert testimony of our witnesses and jurors. And she's going to have a chance to respond um, and talk to us today. And I think I've been given an envelope with all of the forms that you all filled out um, with uh, your requests and also um, a summary, I believe, of all of the witness testimony. So no pressure, but there's pressure. Take that back to D.C. and uh, help us do some good work, okay? So I appreciate you. Um, if you want to talk here and, and give your Thank you. speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the time, the invitation. As was shared, my name is Gloria Montaño Green. I'm the Deputy Undersecretary of Farm Production and Conservation. That is not a title that I carry lightly. Um, it's a very humbling title, um, but it's more humbling to be here in front of you all and the work that you have moved um, and are moving uh, to be able to move forward. Um, a little bit about myself, because uh, I was having a conversation in the airport of where are, who are you? Um, we haven't seen you in some of these movement and spaces like we have some of the other um, individuals that are appointed at USDA. Um, I spent my, la my 20 years in career um, starting in Congress to be able to think of how do you make government accessible. I've had a variety of policy and expertise. I'm from a rural part of Arizona, it's Arlington. I know there's an Arlington, Texas, and Arlington, Virginia. It's Arlington, Arizona. I'm pretty proud of it, but you can't find it on most maps. Um, and that's pretty okay. My postmaster general was my Avon lady, and she was also the localized mayor because there wasn't enough people to vote and make it a community. Um, and uh, I guess what would be equivalent of a 7-Eleven was the closest thing, and that was 30 miles away. Those are my roots. Um, but I have not done only agriculture and only specifically, like I shared, I've worked on thinking about access. Access in health, access in immigration, access in census, access in environment, access in energy, and access in agriculture. While it wasn't mentioned, the greatest theme here is the more we make things complicated, the more things we make them less accessible, and the more barriers we put up, the less people will be able to have um, ability to improve. I had a conversation with a friend earlier this week. I don't want to use the word empower, right? Because empower suggests you never had power to begin with. But there are a lot of things in the room or in a system or in a community that are put up to be able to remove power. So how do we work to make sure to engage and remove those barriers? I joined the Biden administration because I thought I was never going to work for government and definitely was never going to move back to DC. But I got a call to serve. And my desire to serve um, was based on saying, we want to do things different. We want to understand how we can move things, how to make change. Um, and we're going to get to lean in on equity. And we're going to get to lean in on people. And while we do the policy, that those things are very important to move forward. So I have joined this administration. Um, I want to recognize my colleagues that are here today from USDA. Some of them are very familiar because they've been uh, raising more hell and less corn for decades, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Um, Zach Ducheneau, who's the administrator of Farm Service Agency. One of the great things about um, uh, the administrator is he spent a lot in the majority of his career trying to change FSA and make sure that ag financing was right for people, and he gets to do it from the inside. It's a pretty beautiful thing to see. You have Scott Marlowe, who also devoted his life to be able to make sure that we were thinking about farm health um, uh, access. How are we working on those producers? How are we understanding the systems that they're in? And now he gets to also be on the inside leading efforts. <laughs> Molly Carey, a child of an alum, uh, a trainee, uh, of the farm aid movement has joined us as well over at USDA Farm Service Agency. 
Uh, Dr. Goldman, who had to leave to another commitment, um, but has spent a lot of his career to make sure that there are, how are you focusing on black growers, uh, specifically in Arkansas, um, and is the first ever senior advisor for racial justice and equity to serve directly as secretary. And I will say it's an amazing job that he has, but his face time with the secretary is so much time a day because that's where the policies need to be constantly with him. And we have Cecilia Hernandez, who serves in many roles, but many of you, some of you in the room know her as the designated field <laughs> official for the Equity Commission and has made sure it's not just one in name, but one in action and movement and milestone moving to get us to change systems at USDA. Uh, we have Samantha Joseph. Here, okay. <laughs> Uh, Samantha Joseph, who serves as the, I'm going to mess up your title, so sorry, Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership, and has been doing much collaboration across the country, um, and this week just completed a very successful focus on Farm Stress Network and bringing together major policy uh, organizations to understand that that has to be as front and center as purchasing your fertilizer, purchasing your seeds, f uh, watering and maintaining your fields. And then we have... And Rudy Soto is also in the room. He's currently serving as the Acting Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, External Intermental Intergovernmental Affairs um, from Idaho, and has definitely been bridging communities to make sure are we thinking and bringing more folks into USDA so they know us, know us with this current administration and are always part of um, USDA if we're going to make long-term change. So I share these folks. Um, I agreed to take the appointment because um, I guess I'm a uh, glutton for punishment for public service. <laughs> I look at Doc and I don't know if we work less than 15, 18 hour days, but it's, uh, as he said, we got to do it until we can't uh, do it anymore. Um, but you know, there's a Mexican saying that says, Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Uh, tell me who you're with and it'll tell me who you are. And I think of these appointees um, that I get to sit as a first Latina appointee overseeing Farm Service Agency, Risk Management Agency, Natural Resources Conservation Services, from a community of a, a father that um, wanted to do agriculture but couldn't do agriculture. Um, so he was a hobby farmer, I guess. That's something I've actually recently learned, that how you define him. And I get to be able to oversee this. But there's a lot of firsts um, at USDA, and we're not symbolically first. We are placed there because of experience and desire to make change and to make improvements. And that was a very intentional effort that was taken by the Secretary Vilsack to be able to say, I got another time at the department. I know there's a ship that needs to be changed and maybe there's other folks and other voices that need to help with that ship change because of their experience. Um, so that really is symbolic. You all mentioned um, the state of play, the focus for so long has been on the large and building of the greater farm. Um, we have been lucky in that there has been, Congress has been pretty active and given us some other tools and that we get to implement items and discussions in between the farm bill. And the passage of a bill is important, but the implementation of the bill, it's a headache, but it's even more important. We have been implementing the American Rescue Plan the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Emergency Relief Program, um, and also for what was remaining of the Pandemic Assistance Program, we put a pause on that when we got in and said, maybe we can think about distributing it a little bit differently because we knew it didn't get distributed to better serve um, the more. We have a very clear charge from the Secretary. How do we keep farmers farming? How do we build the bottom up? the middle out? How do we think about small and mid-sized farmers at the same level that farmer, the farmers have been focused on for such a long time? How do you think about urban agriculture and innovation agriculture? And how do you think about beginning farmers? It's a, con it's a very easy, it's a not an easy charge, it's a very clear charge because those are the questions we're asking. So as we design programs, those are the underlying items to think of. Do we completely do the exact same thing we've always done? Or do we think of who are the new cus who are the non-customers that have never been served? That is a constant terminology that we get to engage in. Who are the non-customers? The customers we know. 
And we know the customers sometimes need a lot more, but the non-customers haven't even felt the trust to come in the door, haven't seen a program that reflects them, and haven't seen a process to be able to make them engage. So a lot of the things that you raise, some of them are very specific in Farm Bill and what it tells us to do, and other times, you brought in a lot of creative people at the helm of FSA to be able, and uh, USDA to be able to think of, can we think differently, can we serve more, uh, and can we distribute? Um, we have a lot of work that we're doing here. We're doing market work, climate work, uh, food system engagement, um, equity, uh, and trying to, to do a little bit better um, and address um, our past discriminations. Uh, I, I love being a historian. I, do I think I used to be a historian? Um, but mostly to study the social and civil rights movements um, across. Change is slow, but it's good. And it has to constantly be moving. Um, so we thank you all for trusting us, being patient, being our conscious to remind us to keep moving forward. We've invested in quite a few items. We have the Climate Partnership for Climate Smart Commodity, and I know there were some concerns that were raised about that, but I do want to share with you that program, we designed it a little bit differently. We didn't have a prescriptive way of engaging. We said, here's some problems that we have. What are your solutions? Because it's not just carbon that we need to think about for Climate Smart and development of markets and making sure that we're going to have investments in producers. We wanted to be able to say, well, how are you approaching this, and how are you investing in climate change, and how can we learn data? We had a really robust proposal on those. Um, and I have visited various projects, and they've also been very intersectional. And intersectional is not an intimidating word. It just means people have an understanding that values and returns can be in different ways. We've seen people that do food nutrition and nutrition security while they're doing beginning farmer uh, innovation and incubation work. Uh, we've had return of uh, crops and industries to communities that have historically lost them so they can understand what that means to better and serve climate engagement. When we put out that proposal, we did a first thing for USDA in that we said, if we're going to put out this proposal, we're also going to weigh how you're engaging underserved producers. And that's not just going to be a mention. We're going to weigh it in the evaluation proposal system. And so it's a first. It's a learning. How do we tweak it? How do we improve it? But we put some teeth behind those requirements of underserved needed to be included in that process. So it's something that, based on comments in the room, I would really make sure um, some of you in the room are actually partners in those projects, um, but want to be able to see how do we learn and how do we actually put stronger teeth in those if those are the things we want to see. While I don't get to work on it too much, um, USDA has invested quite a bit in local and regional food systems, leveraging the American Rescue Plan to be able to think of if we know it's a delicate food system and a food supply and we need to be able to support local processing and local engagement, let's invest in that. Let's have multi-year investments to be able to have regional food systems. Um, and to be able to think of how do we invest in WIC and SNAP, how does it combine with food banks? How do we think about those food banks to farms that have been engaged and can we better support those? We have leveraged the American Rescue Plan. We could have very easily just added to new programs, very easily. My children probably would have appreciated it uh, if we could have taken the easy route on some of these bills and implementation. It got announced. We have some work to be able to see, but the planning, the investment, and the results that are supposed to have have some returns to think of things differently because we can't continue to fund the same thing and expect a different result. The system is made to set up, is made to be successful. So we have to set up new systems for different successes that we want to see. Uh, so equity, like I shared earlier, it's one of, the, one of the things that attracted me to leave Arizona part-time, to come to D.C. part-time, because Arizona's hot, but Arizona's really beautiful. Um, but getting to work for an administration that's not afraid to talk about equity is a first. And equity on action, um, equity is forever work in a good way. And equity is not an intimidation. Equity doesn't mean one person gets less to be able to give. It means that we stop and take a question and say, who has been in the room? And we would be much better if more people were in the room and we could be stronger. That's what we get to do on equity. 
And it was shared earlier where somebody, you know, equity for us got different ways. It's size of crop, where you grow your crop, what your crop is, race, ethnicity, gender. Um, it's a very large volume. And for us, it also means staffing. Uh, it means where are we putting, spending our money? Where are we investing our programs? Uh, we have a lot of robust um, efforts that we're doing. We have multiple pillars of equity investment at USDA. Um, there's the Equity Commission, of which we have several members in here, and I want to thank you all for applying, agreeing to serve, and beginning to trust that we are going to do things differently. So appreciate for all of those in the room. Uh, we have the program Equity and Diversity, equ Equity Inclusion and Accessibility, in which we just hired our first permanent Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer with staff and engagement. And then every single agency and every single department had to put forward an equity action plan that is measured monthly on progress and what barriers we need to be able to identify for the secretary if we're not making progress on them. We just officially announced them publicly, but I would say the team has been working on them way longer before they become public items. I do want to focus on the Equity Commission because whenever that was created, um, we got a lot of questions to say, why is this one different? USDA has received thousands of recommendations and thousands of reports. But this one's different because we got some of the people that critiqued us the most, but also know USDA has the most potential to invest and improve communities. And we weren't afraid to receive those critiques. In fact, it's much better for us to have them so we can actually better solve. If we can agree what the problem is, we can better solve with the better work on those solutions. They released in February a really robust set of equity commission recommendations. Uh, we went through very clearly to say, what can USDA do at the helm versus what do we need legislative change or maybe we need rule changes because what was shared earlier with the farm bill and engagement, if it's in the farm bill, it has to be implemented in some ways those rules. You can be creative, but if it's statute, we gotta follow it. Um, so really thinking about the equity commission, if you haven't looked at those report and recommendations, very similar voices, um, very similar items of what was raised today were included. And I'm sure with the written testimony as we go through, there might be some similarities of where we need to make change, where we need to make improvements. Um, some of those items do not require us to work on the Farm Bill, uh, require guidance from the Farm Bill, and some of them do. Uh, I want to take a minute to then talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, because we've talked about it a little bit throughout the session today, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to join the morning session. Uh, but we have um, a few items that we're implementing at the Inflation Reduction Act at USDA. I'm going to really specifically talk about the Farm Production and Conservation Mission Area. Um, we received the Increasing Land Access Program to be able to address if we want beginning farmers or we want to be able to make sure that farmers are staying in agriculture or are entering into agriculture, if they don't have access to land, capital, or to be able to understand markets, they're not going to be successful. The Inflation Reduction Act just gave us money. We were able to identify 50 projects and $300 million to invest. That's a one-time money that we received from Congress. Um, I think that's a proposal that I've seen float around for others to be able to say, how can we do a very explicit investment? As those begin to get implemented, I think the returns that we're able to see, what we can learn, and how do we um, amplify that will be really important to go forward. Um, under uh, Zach's leadership and Scott's leadership, we've been implementing Section 22006, uh, which is to be able to invest $3.1 billion to provide relief for distressed borrowers uh, within US FSA. When we were implementing it, the secretary told us very clearly, I want to keep farmers farming. I want to take them back from the brink of bankruptcy. And I want to make sure, like, how can we, how can we make change and make it some long-term change? We robustly, within two months, we did a different system in that we paid and made payments without having an application process in the office because if we could identify and know, we could target. Um, we've been working on ways to understand um, extreme measures and uh, extreme impacts to be able to di further distribute those dollars. And we've been also looking and taking as an opportunity of can we improve ag financing programs at USDA. One of the examples is we just moved that application from 35 pages to 12, is that right? 25 pages? 29 pages to 13 pages. Uh, we are currently test piling um, a different way to underwrite them to see if we can find some efficiencies. And we're looking at um, other ways to better 
think about how our programs can better define um, where the, the loan can go, how we actually put um, um, equity, financial equity, uh, in a better spot uh, for individuals. We've leveraged that to be able to say, here, it is 3.1 billion, let's implement it, but it's actually do something for the long haul and see if we can make systematic change to make it a better situation. Now the thresholds, et cetera, that were mentioned earlier, those are definitely Congress limitations that are put in there. But there are other things that we can better engage, better train staff, um, and better think about systems. Uh, we have been working pretty robustly uh, to implement it. We know there's still more funds to be able to go through. But we've been having a very hard conversation with ourselves, which is we can easily put dollars out the door, but where do we need to make impact and where do we need to make changes? And how do we understand folks' situation? And we also understand there's a lot of individuals that have loan and debt that haven't necessarily been USDA loan and debt. Uh, so, but we have limitations within the law. Uh, but we're working on moving forward. And I think for those who have constantly been giving us advice, uh, constantly reminding us of the items. And while it's not part of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, since we joined in January of 21, we have not foreclosed or liquidated any farm loans at the FSA. Uh, we have a little bit more control over our direct loans than our guaranteed, but when we've heard of guaranteed, we've done um, as much intervention as we are allowed to legally to make sure that folks understand, let's get individuals into right. Let's focus on saving the farm versus uh, worried about um, as much about the loan. It was mentioned a little bit earlier today, um, the uh, discrimination financial assistance payment, I think that might have been talked about quite a bit more. I want to thank the cooperators in the room that have come to join us because we understand we're very um, self-reflective, I think, at USDA, which we're not, we're not going to do this alone. We need trusted individuals. They might trust Scott. They might trust me. They might not trust Scott. They might not trust me. But they're going to trust the person who's been giving them um, the constant um, ag financing for 20 years through FLAG. Uh, or through the land loss prevention. So thank you for the partners for lending your word, to lending your voice, lending your insight to implement this. The discrimination financial assistance payment uh, is to provide financial assistance to those who face discrimination in USDA farm lending uh, prior to January of 2021. This is an implementation of Section 22007 of the Inflation Reduction Act. We know we've received thousands of interests. We know it's a very large application. But it's also an application because we didn't want to be prescriptive. We know everybody's experience is a little bit different, and how they want to share it can be different. Um, how they were impacted might not be in an FSA record, and it might be in a different way of how they engage with their USDA offices. Uh, this is a much broader part of our work to do equity. Um, it is not going to be the sole item to be able to move us, and we understand it. Um, we opened this up on July 7th. Um, based on a lot of feedback, today we announced that we are extending that deadline to complete the applications to January 13th of 2024. <laughs> uh, if I would encourage those, like, we all know deadlines are what people work on, but it'd be really great if folks start working on getting those applications in to help reduce their personal stress and yours. Um, we also know that the FSA records has been a question to be able to go. We designed a program that your FSA record is not required to complete the application, but we know folks will want to get their application, their FSA records. That application, the request to get the FSA records is November 3rd. That way we can make sure people have it in their hands uh, prior to the application deadline to be able to engage there. We are taking the steps to be able to implement it, to be able to address it. We've extended the hours of the program, um, office hours locally. Um, Congress did require us that we did get, have to implement it through a third party um, individual and that, that USDA and FSA would not implement it. And I wanna be clear, it is not FSA administered. It is sitting with an FPAC, Farm Food Production and Conservation Mission Area, but is not a Farm Service Agency implementation. Uh, and then finally, I just want to be able to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act because there's a lot of funds to be able to invest and to be able to receive. It was talked about in several of the testimony today, the need to have the environmental quality incentive programs 
a need to be able to have uh, various technical assistance, financial assistance for conservation work. The Inflation Reduction Act gave us $19.5 billion to be able to implement. Um, and they gave it to us at how much we're supposed to do year by year. Um, our focus is making sure we are implementing it, that we are focusing on the greenhouse gas reduction, which the inflation reduction shares with us to do, but they were also thinking about customers and non-customers. How are we bringing in new customers with this portfolio of money that we can better engage? And individuals that are small farmers, farmers that haven't necessarily thought to uh, knock on the door uh, because they always heard, oh, they don't have enough money, they're oversubscribed. We're still gonna be oversubscribed based on what we're seeing in fiscal year 23. The demand is still exceeding what we have, but we have more money to distribute. So uh, for those that are interested in conservation, if you haven't had one or with your local partners, make sure to contact your NRCS office and just do an education event to be able to find out how you can take and get signed up for these respective programs. Uh, I share with you what we're doing at USDA and we know we have to do a lot more. We're not afraid to hear from you. We're not afraid to hear guidance. Uh, I think there's been a lot of great progress that we've done in the last two and a half years. We have to celebrate it. And we also look at it and it's like we have so much more to do. Um, and so we just ask you to have patience with us, give us grace. We know we have to move at the speed of trust. But some of that trust is also how do you help us change the system so a new system is set up to be as successful as it's supposed to be. Thank you very much uh, for the comments and look forward to taking back the testimony back to DC with me. Thank you so much, Deputy Undersecretary. And thanks to everyone from USDA for, for all of the important work that you do and for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, you all are amazing because you're hanging in. So we're almost done, okay? Um, for the final segment of the People's Hearing, I'm pleased to welcome to the podium Rania Masri of uh, North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. She's the co-director of uh, organizing and policy there and offers decades of experience as both a policy expert and organizer. I think she has the hardest job of anyone today because she's got to summarize and synthesize all that she's heard um, and, and uh, kind of give us a, a little summary back to us and, and just kind of close us out. So you can, you're on the home stretch. Take us home. Thank you. Um, like you said, my name is Rania Al-Masri. I'm the co-director of the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, and I actually think I have a very blessed job here, which is one, to be with you all at this particular time. So thank you to Farm Aid for this invitation. Thank you to Madame Depu Deputy Undersecretary for being here. Yes, it's my job to synthesize what you all said, but I'm not just gonna repeat it back to you because you all were here, you heard it all. I do wanna start by saying that the original Farm Bill was enacted during the 1930s as part of the New Deal, and it was crafted to respond to the crisis of corporate consolidation and influence. So I heard folks from the jury saying it feels like the 1980s. It feels like the 1930s to me. Where are we now? Since the mid-1980s, more than 80% of hog farmers have been put out of business. Four multinational corporations control more than 70% of the entire U.S. pork market. Six percent of farming operations produce 90 percent of all meat, dairy, and poultry. Are we surprised? No, because just like Patty said at the beginning, they were the ones that built the system. In 1990, just some 30 years ago, small and medium-sized farms accounted for half of agricultural production in the United States. Now, it's less than a quarter. We've lost so much, so quickly. And with the loss of these family farms came the loss of the communities that they supported. And this is what is key, and I think this is what we need to remember. While these family farms retreated when they closed, the businesses they helped support also disappeared. The local seed and equipment suppliers also disappeared. The local vets, also disappeared. Shops, restaurants, and doctors, and clinics also disappeared. We have county upon county in North Carolina that now have to go more, drive more than the golden hour to even get to a basic clinic, and don't get me started that they can't even afford the health care that they can't even access. A community of owners, of farmers, have become serfs on the land. 
serfs on the land. If you want to work on a farm, you have to work for them. They will give us a job, and you're going to be working on their terms. They control everything, and yet they have the audacity to call factory farms farms. It's industrial agriculture. It's not farming. And all the while, all the while, and this is what's an additional really key, all the while the quality of the food has decreased. The nutritional quality of the food has decreased 30 to 40 percent. While the land, the water, and the air gets more polluted. And they talk about laws, state laws, such as the Orwellian named right to farm laws, were changed to protect these industries rather than to protect the family farms and the communities. When we win legislation, they change the law. This is where we are right now. Since the last Farm Bill in 2018, the cost to feed a family of four, barely feed a family of four, has increased 51% while top meat and poultry and companies have taken in skyrocketing profits. I personally would love to see our farmers do what we are seeing our comrades at the United Auto Workers do. I would love to see that happen. <laughs> Solutions have been presented here. No one in Congress can claim, sorry, we didn't know there was an alternative to the Farm Bill. Sorry, we didn't know there was an alternative to protecting industries because you all have showed them the way. They have chosen not to listen. Confronting corporate power in the Farm Bill, what do we need? You all have stated it include mandatory country of origin labeling for beef. We say that we live in a country of free speech, but how come we don't get access to the information that is necessary for us to make the decisions? You all have said it, stronger packers and stockyard rules. And stop promoting methane digesters, stop greenwashing the methane biodigesters. This is not a solution for climate change. Stop funding them with taxpayers through the Inflation Reduction Act. Stop pretending that these biodigesters actually support BIPAC communities because they happen to be in BIPAC communities, <laughs> which is what's happening. We need a farm bill that stops mega mergers. Decades of lax antitrust enforcement have created a food system defined by consolidation. We've heard a gentleman said earlier that, you know, we can't fight the antitrust because the powers that be in Congress think it's efficient, they think it's cheaper. The question is, cheaper for who? Cheaper for who? Because it's not cheaper for the people, it's not cheaper for the land, it's not cheaper for the animals, it's not cheaper for our future, it's just cheaper for the pockets of the shareholders in those four companies. You have presented solutions on climate change, on climate science and environmental justice. The climate crisis is here. We're no longer talking about it like we were in the 80s, that it's coming. It is here. And the solutions are clear. The solutions are the way we've, we've been practicing farming for hundreds, no, thousands of years. Diversified farm systems, sustainable agroecology, and conserve those wetlands, Congress. Conserve those wetlands, EPA. Do not do what North Carolina has done, which is open up 50% of our wetlands to development and then wonder why our lands get flooded. The Clean Air Act, ironically, the Clean Air Act does not require industrial farms to report on emissions related to livestock. Why not? Why do we allow, why does Congress allow the hijacking of big agriculture into programs like environmental quality incentives programs? Why do they do that? Third aspect, racial justice in the farm bill, what do we need? Nobody brought up this statistic, but it is so powerful that I cannot but bring it up. It has to start with recognizing and addressing the historic racial injustice in land ownership. The Atlantic reported in 2019, through a variety of means, sometimes legal, often coercive, oftentimes both legal and coercive, 98% of black agricultural landowners and farmers, farmlands owned by black people, came into the hands of white people. We are talking about one 
million black families ripped from their farms. You want to talk about racial justice? It starts by recognizing that history and paying compensation for that theft. Not doing what folks are doing in Florida, which is slavery was actually good for the slaves, is what they're teaching now. And then talk about racial justice. Black farmers in the United States, black farmers in the United States lost roughly 326 billion dollars worth of acreage during the 20th century. Many of this loss was legal. What do we need? We need to increase access to programs and increase, increase language accessibility. That means that we increase it not simply by making it accessible, but we make it understandable and we make it available in Spanish. <laughs> there is one word that represents farmers in this room more than any other word, and I have felt it since yesterday, and I've been honored to be with you as a non-farmer, and that one word is community. You have shown time and time again that no farmer can stand in isolation at all. Farmers and the communities that love our farmers, we are the majority. We are the many. The others, the agro-industrialists and their moneyed lobbyists and the congressmen and women who they pay to put in power, they are the few. We are the many. This is what we need to remember. Now imagine, imagine if the USDA were to invite Farm Aid and the farmers here to testify to Congress as to how we want the Farm Bill to be written. Imagine if the USDA were to say, farmers, y'all should write it. Let's see that. Let's see Congress open up its platform for you all. Could you do that? Could you at least make that appeal? This is how we center equity, by centering your place at the table. Our people, just like Rosa Safedra said, our people have been made invisible through laws. And when you make us invisible, you make us disposable. And our people are not disposable. No people is disposable. Our lands are not sacrifice zones for them to throw their CAFOs and their oil pipelines into them. No land should be a sacrifice zone. What kind of an economic system do we need to build that rejects the very concept of disposability and sacrifice zones? That is what we need to put forward. That is what we need to have the courage of imagination so that we take that imagination to Congress and we tell them that is the America we want to live in. That is the democracy we want and not the America of industrial corporations that purchase their congressmen. That is the America we want to live in. And because, because this farm bill has global reach, and because we know that a lot of these multinational corporations also have global reach, that Smithfield, purchased by the Chinese because the environmental regulations in China are more stringent than those in North Carolina, they take the model in North Carolina and they're taking it to Bolivia. So we know, as farmers and the communities that love the farmers, that the world is our backyard. So we want to ask, what kind of world do we want to build? A world in which the path is the path of humanity, the path of community, the path of humility towards the earth, or the path of corporate, destructive, capitalistic greed. I think we have made our voices very clear today. And let's remember, we're not fighting the laws of thermodynamics. We're not fighting the laws of nature. We're fighting the laws of the decision makers. So we have the courage to break free from those laws and to break free from those decision makers by voting other people into office. Thank you.
There's really nothing else to be said. Um, <laughs> North Carolina, stand up. North Carolina, North Carolina, stand up. Yep. I, you know, I was talking to Cass like, yo, I, we didn't come up with a closing. <laughs> it's closed. Um, I do want to take a moment. Um, you know, community. How do we belong to each other? How are we showing up for each other? That's our charge, along with everything <laughs> that Raina said. We have the opportunity to show up for each other. So I want us to come away from here thinking about our next steps, our next thing. And Farm Aid is a hub to listen and support that next thing, okay? We wanna be informed by y'all in order to, be, to have our, our marching orders for going forward. I do wanna take a moment to recognize the rest of the Farm Aid team um, Farm Aid folks, stand up, please. Come on, come on, come on. This is our program team. We got our podcasters in the back. They did so much hard work to get this day together, the day before together, and it was truly a labor of love. You know, I remember when I first came to Farm Aid in 2014, um, I, I was so fascinated about how Farm Aid treated farmers like the VIPs that, that I already knew they were. And I was like, yo, I got to get to know these people. They're doing it right. So I'm so grateful to be among them at this time in my life. So, um, Carolyn, do you want to add anything before? Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to our interpreters and our ASL <laughs> interpretation. Thank y'all so much. Thank you to our translators in the back. Thank y'all so much. Um, today lives on our YouTube channel, so you can revisit it. And, and we, like I said, this is not an end point. This is our marching orders for moving forward. So let's stay engaged. Sound good? Sound good? All right. And um, if you got credentials, come and talk to me, because I think if you We'll, we'll work that out. We'll work out credi credentials that you may be able to come to the press event. We could talk more about that later. We don't want to do that here. But um, mostly I just want to express our gratitude on behalf of all our Farm Aid family. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, we'll see you <laughs> later on. <laughs>